It's time for Twit This Week in Tech. Great panel for you. Seth Weintraub, the guy who started 9 to 5 Mac. He's currently publisher at Electric. Uh, he's going to join Greg Farrow of Packet Pushers. He's always great for a quote. And Larry Maggot from CBS News Radio. Lots to talk about, including a preview of what Apple might announce tomorrow at WWDC. The end of trending topics at Facebook. And autonomous vehicles, the future of driving. It's all coming up next on Twit. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Tech is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twit This Week in Tech, episode 669, recorded Sunday, June 3rd, 2018. 15 minutes of fun. This Week in Tech is brought to you by Casper, a sleep brand that continues to revolutionize its line of products to create an exceptionally comfortable sleep experience one night at a time. You can save $50 toward select mattresses by visiting casper.com slash twit and using the code twit at checkout. And by Rocket Mortgage from Quicken Loans. Home plays a big role in your life. That's why Quicken Loans created Rocket Mortgage. It lets you apply simply and understand the entire mortgage process fully so you can be confident you're getting the right mortgage for you. Get started at rocketmortgage.com slash twit2. And by Blue Apron, the number one fresh ingredient and recipe delivery service in the country. Check out this week's menu and get three meals free with free shipping at blueapron.com slash twit. And by Moogsoft. Reduce IT alerts and tickets by up to 99%. Visit Moogsoft.com to learn more and sign up for a demo. It's time for Twit This Week in Tech, the show where we cover the week's tech news. Each week we put together an illustrious panel of journalists and tech experts. And I, I venture to say you're going to like this week's panel. It's, it's going to be a lot of fun. Larry Maggot is here from CBS News Radio, ConnectSafely.org. It's great to see you again, Larry. Always good to see you, Leo. Welcome. Getting ready for WWDC. Yep. You'll be going yep. tomorrow. Yeah. Going tomorrow morning. You know, it seems like an annual, it is an annual ritual, so why not? I could tell you somebody who is not invited, no. <laughs> besides me, <laughs> uh, and we welcome him for the first time to Twit, but I've been wanting to get this guy for a long time. Seth Weintraub is here. Seth, you're probably known as the publisher of Electric, which is the, uh, electric.com is the magazine about electric vehicles. He's founded, created 9to5Mac, 9to5Google. Uh, and you said you have a new one, Seth. Yeah, we have a new uh, site called dronedj.com. So great to have you here. I've, I've been a hey, my pleasure. fan from a distance for a long, long time. And we met a year ago at Google I.O., and I've been meaning ever since to get you on the show, so I'm so glad you could and, do And Seth rivals Thanks me as one of your few guests with a professional microphone. I, he I, looks I, good, I like doesn't he? Mic. Yeah, what kind of mic is that? It's a road podcaster. Oh, see? Okay. But it looks like We've an RE20. It looks like an RE20. It looks nice. What's, do, you, do you do an electric uh, podcast? Yeah, we do every Friday at like 4.30, 5 o'clock. Nice. I have so many questions about electric vehicles. Uh, and we actually were talking before the show, but I'm sure there'll be more to talk about as the show progresses. Also, uh, where are you located, Seth? Are you in the West Coast? No, I'm actually in New York City, a little City. bit north in okay. Westchester. Okay, so it's evening where you are, but it's late at night where this guy is. Greg Farrow joins us from the Packet Pushers Network. He is a network wizard and always fun on the show, and thank you for staying up late for us. He's pulling the muff off his professional road oh, podcaster. Wow. Three professional wow. microphones yes. on the show. Yes. That's a record. Love that. I thought uh, were just, I'll Love leave that. it off. I won't put it back on. Yeah, yeah you don't no, need it. I have an old-fashioned analog Thanks. road, as a matter of fact. Oh, really? Three roads <laughs> and a high. I've got a, it's hooked up to a USB adapter, but it's analog to begin with. Sounds like a yeah. road is a Australian company. Is, is it? it not? Yes, I believe it so. Oh. Yes. They do it all out of Melbourne, I think. Oh, I did not know yeah. that. Huh. Yep. Yeah, the Rode Podcaster was one of the very first really good microphones that you could use, USB microphones you could use as a podcast. Yeah, I use the, I use Rode for everything. I use it for the uh, when I do uh, YouTube. I'm using the Rode um, Video Micro Pro, which goes on the back and runs off my iPhone, and that's how I do all of my YouTube. I used to have this massive, tel you know, camera rig recording in 4K, and I've ended up just plugging my iPhone into a hand rig, and that's all I ever use. 
Yeah, I love. I have a Rode stereo mic for my uh, my Canon. Um, yeah, with yeah. a big dead cat on it, and I'm not saying yeah, yeah. that because I don't like cats, although I don't. Yeah. But <laughs> so I just use a. There it glyph. is. That's a big puffy but, muff. Yeah, I have a that. glyph, and this is my Rode little Rodey yeah. video thing, yeah. and then just click the camera in and yep. plug it in, and that's yeah. how I do YouTube. Awesome. Have yeah. I ever showed you the, the microphone that CBS issued me for field work? Oh, this I gotta see. Yeah, nothing great. Yeah. So this is from this the Tiffany mic. Network. It, this mic, if if you look at it really closely, you probably can't see it. It says Mutual. <laughs> so you, so CBS acquired Mutual like a million years ago. Right? So that mic is literally from the 60s. It is. So I plugged this guy into it, the little Shure. Is that a Shure? It looks like a Shure SM58. Well, now it's now it's a USB, right? So this is a USB. Oh, yeah, so you I'm, got the icicle on so it. So when this, when this mic rolled off the assembly line, USB wasn't even a pipe oh, dream. that's got an but, XLR. But sh take off the muff because I want to see what the top of it uh, Oh, is. gosh. You, I can you tell you what it hammer. is from the... Yeah, you probably know this. I, that's an SM58. Sure is. No, it's, no, no, no. This is a uh, the, the SM58. The, this is an Electra Voice. Uh, oh, it's an EV. 635A. Yeah, they made the one SM58 very similar. The SM58 is big. Is bigger. Yeah. This is a real. This mic is like that? the mic for. I think recording. Edward R. Murrow used that mic. <laughs> this particular mic. He he actually could have. That, that would not have been impossible for him to have used this one. So, so just right. in I case you ever wanted to know how little voice has changed in 40 years, you've just witnessed it right there, the XLR jack. Yeah. And there's nothing, nothing new in voice technology. Nothing's changed. Nothing's, nothing's changed. changed. So right. WWDC is tomorrow, the Worldwide Developers Conference. And uh, I hope you don't mind, Seth, if I invoke Mark Gurman. No, no. We're still good friends. Great guy. Yeah. Of course, cut his teeth. He was like 15 when you hired him at 9 to 5 Mac. <clears throat> I think so. Maybe yeah. maybe even younger. He was a kid. And uh, he was 22 two years ago when Bloomberg stole him away from you. And he's done a good Bastards. job over there. He's kept all of his uh, contacts. And he said something quite surprising on Friday. I, would, I can't tell you because I don't pay for Bloomberg. And they've put themselves <laughs> behind a ridiculous $35 a month paywall. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. uh, but he says, uh, his sources tell him, Apple will not unveil any new hardware tomorrow. Hmm. And I have to give, first of all, it's German. So it's, uh, you know, his sources are impeccable and he's rarely wrong. But also, this close to the event, I have to think this is a leak from Apple trying to dampen expectations because if people didn't know that the expectation has been high that there will at least be new macbooks possibly new ipads maybe even a new iphone se and if they hadn't told people that ahead of time there'd be a lot of disappointment tomorrow i think the robert Mueller leak did actually that's, <laughs> that's what trump said nothing comes out of robert Mueller's office this we know so uh seth so, you seen do you think that's credible so well i don't think apple leaked it um, really? but, uh, not to German. I, I, if Apple leaked it, it'd be the German. wall street journal. Yeah. You know how it works. Yep. Uh, so clearly, uh, you know, there's probably, there might be, you know, they could announce something's coming way down the road or something, but there's not going to be any, it doesn't sound like there's going to be any new hardware at WWDC. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's in the pipe. Like, like there has to be some new Macs coming soon. Uh, everything's kind of long in the tooth there. Um, you know, we know about yeah, the SE2 or sure whatever. I'm not sure about that. Do you really think that there's actually going to be some new Macs? Like Intel hasn't got any new CPUs. There'll be no, no new wait CPUs a minute. from no, wait Intel a minute. this year. This That's was right. the exciting, this was the thing I was waiting for. I was waiting for a MacBook Pro with one of these new six-core Intel processors, an i9, and Optane. Mm -hmm. I think that that actually is some pretty compelling yes. hardware, which just came Thank out. Intel it announced be. it and then said it, but it won't be shipping until mid 2019 this week. What? The i9 won't come out. No Optane. What? No, no, no Optane and no no Canon Lakes. Nothing will ship till mid 2000. Like they'll release sampling quantities. Um, I was reading an article about they're oh. releasing like a hundred thousand or something, and then all the makers will share a small number, so there'll be something that ships, and Intel will meet the promise that something will ship in 2018. But there'll be no volume CPUs, so there's a fair chance that Apple won't commit to a small production no. run, in my opinion. Yeah. What do you think, Seth? You're the expert in this field. Apple hasn't been very aggressive in their Ever. Uh, yeah. Mac world anything lately. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I feel like... Ever. It was always the case that... Uh, uh, actually, no, maybe. There was, a, there was a time when Intel would have a new processor, and then shortly after that, Apple would have 
new Macs, yeah. but that has not yeah. been the case but for some time. My, my MacBook yeah, Air feels is like that was a that microphone that I showed you. I mean, yeah. it's getting it's getting crazy. Oh, I could beat you. Years. Uh, my Mac Pro is from 2013. <laughs> yeah, you beat me on that one. Well, but but yeah, the MacBook that, Air that I have doesn't look any different than the one that came out, what, 2010? When, when did they first my, ship that? The truth is because I hate these new Mac keyboards so much. This butterfly key is awful. Yeah. Uh, I bought when the 2016 new MacBook Pros with the touch bar and the butterfly key came out. I bought one. Immediately, I hated the touch bar so much. It would, I would hit, the Siri would start up randomly. So, because I would, because I would hit it and I didn't, and I thought, well, if I've got a touch bar, I can't disable it. So I just said, okay, I'm going to trade this in for the one without the touch bar. But the keyboard was still bad. So I went back to the 2015 MacBook Pro, which is frankly the last decent MacBook. Mm. It's hard to do, so, disagree with that. that. There's a lot of people who don't like the keyboard and a lot more people who don't like the touch touch bar. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Apple I'm, still I'm sells. Nothing. They still sell this 2015 15-inch MacBook Pro. That tells me there's a reason. That tells me yeah, well, that, there's that's a the market for time. that. Yeah, well, the, I imagine the those Skylights do pretty well, too. I bet they, they must, or why would Apple keep them in the, uh, the fold? There's, there's, it's still a Haswell processor. Well, I think there's a couple of things here. One is uh, Skylake was the 2015 CPU, and that was the last MacBook that Apple released that had that, and that was the major CPU release. Right. Since then, in 2016, we've had the Intel server CPUs. So we've had KB Lake was the successor to Skylake, which was really the talk, not the tech. It's, and talk, then in it's been talk, 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 talk. Talk, talk, talk. And then you had Canon Lake in 2017 and Coffee Lake, which was meant to, but they sort of hadn't shipped in volume. So their die shrinks. So so Skylake was a 14 nanometer. Canon Lake is a shrink of Skylake to 10 nanometers, so less power, more on the die. It gets a little bit faster. Then there's Coffee Lake, which was meant to be a 14 nanometer process. I'm reading from Wikipedia here and I'm because I can't memorize all this, just in case you think I'm looking smart. And then there's supposed to be a thing coming which is called Ice Lake, which is the successor to Canon Lake. <laughs> it's and for it the was Canadians. supposed to come out. Yes. <laughs> and it was supposed to come out at the end of 2017. Then they said 2018, and now it's 2019. Somebody so says, until there's what you're saying is there's no reason for Apple to upgrade. Well, there's no CPU uh, updates. I think you know how we keep hearing all about this ARM CPU thing that keep people keep going yeah, on about. Yeah, that Apple is going to be switching away from Intel and switch to ARM for yeah. all of its stuff. I imagine that you know if Intel keeps upsetting the supply chain here, which is exactly what they're doing. I imagine if I was Apple, I'd be sitting there saying to myself, if if Intel can't ship these desktop CPUs, whatever the reason might be, whether it's difficult to shrink the die or where they can't get the production runs or nobody's buying desktops or, you know, whatever the mechanics are, Apple might actually start looking at the, the PA semi team and saying, you know, can we boost this ARM CPU and turn so they can turn away from Intel as a supplier? Because every time they go public with the Intel CPU, you know, saying we've got MacBooks in the pipe, or they start to sort of feel people out to see if there's any interest for a new frame, Intel fails to ship. Now, I agree with you. Uh, I'm Rick, shocked. I was... I, I, you, this is bad news. I, I thought the i9 was imminent. No, this is, it's this all end. I yep. was going to, I was, I was, I was, what I was hoping was that tomorrow we'd see new MacBooks with new Intel processors and perhaps in a concession to the class action lawsuits, a somewhat improved keyboard. Mm -hmm. And then when I, when Mark said, well, no, there's not going to be new hardware, I credited him. I thought, well, it's Mark Gurman. It must be true. So I started looking at Lenovo, but they don't have the i9s, and they won't, I guess, until next year. Mm -hmm. I, I, yeah, I mean, they talked about the Ice Lake chips in August. Then they announced them. And then remember, of course, they talked about Optane. We were talking about Optane 18 yeah. months uh, in 2016. I came and uh, I was yes. on the show with you. It's that was the cross the point. That was the new cross point memory technology. Yep. And they so became H Optane. HP and just then, shipped a new laptop, and I actually have it, but I don't know what processor it has. I haven't. Cranked mm, it open it'll yet? It'll be KB Lake or Coffee Lake, right? It won't. Yeah, but be. I mean, they're they've got some beautiful laptops. I think, yeah. I mean, I, th I mean, also, let's not forget <laughs> Spectre yeah. and Meltdown, and and even the ch yeah. you know the chips that you're getting from Intel today uh, <laughs> are vulnerable to these you know uh, issues. And there's yep. to uh, to my knowledge, still three Spectre flaws that have not yet been disclosed. The the newest one was disclosed and presumably patched, but there's three more we don't know about. I mean, this is just bad news, bad so news, did, bad yeah. news. You see so you can see why Apple might... I, this, I do credit you, Greg, with one thing. You can see why Apple might say, 
screw it. We, you know, yep. and by the way, these aren't even really ARM chips. These are Apple A chips that that are licensed ARM architecture, but they do a lot of yeah, customization. They've done a lot of stuff. Mostly what they've done is refocus the die. So a lot of the ARM cores are the same. Um, and they do a lot of optimization, so especially around the memory buses, if I remember rightly, and also to get a, more of them on the die. Anyway, lots of tricks and things that you can do, but fundamentally it's a base ARM architecture. At the best, they can tweak it at the edges and integrate the bus, the fastest bus architectures to the GPUs that they put in them and all that sort of stuff. So that's fine, but I, I keep in mind that Apple only wants to make one notebook. Unlike HPE and Dell, who will happily make 10,000 of one notebook or 20,000 of one notebook and then ship it with a custom SKU just so that Best Buy has a unique one. You know that fiddle that like yeah. when you go to the shop to buy fridges and they say, we'll have the cheapest price on this fridge anywhere. And that's because they're the only one with that model number because it's a unique model number to them. That's why you can't shop them, right? And so this is what HPE and Dell do in the retail channels and they do with enterprise as well. They'll produce 10,000 of this and 20,000 of that and 50,000 of this. Apple won't do that. Apple wants to do one run. It wants to do, you know, a million units or two million units over a life cycle. They'll take one chip like they've done with the, the Skylake from 2015 or the KB Lake and just keep running it out the door. And every now and then you get a bump, but they don't futz around with you know, breaking up their production schedules to be able to accommodate a new chip and a new controller and a new memory. And I, I suspect my, my sense of this, and this is just me, my gut feel, I'm not on the inside to like Seth is, is that Apple's come up with several designs based on Intel's commitments to them about the production. Intel hasn't been able to deliver and so they've just pulled out. But because Apple doesn't communicate with its audience, it doesn't share what it's doing. Yeah, it doesn't give know. people we, got, we, no, we no don't know. We know nothing. But the, yeah. but and the I question think this I have is to ask is who really cares? Aside from, you know, the, the people who are designing rocket ships and, you know, the, the, the geeks, does the average person really need or care whether they have a 2013 or 2016 processor in their laptop? I mean, how many people uh, really complain that their processor is too slow on their, on their PC? Uh, I don't hear that I know a lot of much. video professionals kind of yeah, there's a, there's a niche. There are niches. Photographers, right. videographers, yeah. rocket ship designers. Uh, yeah. the, but but <laughs> that's who buys, but I hate to say it, but that's who buys Macs. Coder, I have to say coders too. Coders are very sensitive to compile times. Uh, if you had a six-core processor and you had a threaded compiler, that makes a huge difference. And so uh, that that cycle, that you know, yeah. write, compile, build, right. run cycle the yeah. faster that goes the better uh, they are so there are what it is is it's the people apple should be and has traditionally cultivated which is the professional market it doesn't the seem tailings. like they're doing much for the professional market i have that imac pro and to to your point exactly larry for 90 percent of what i do it's no faster than my 2015 mm. macbook pro right. because you have to have software that's tuned to use i have 10 cores nine right. of which yeah, do nothing <laughs> Most I, I, mean, I even added video. So I, I, I turned my, my one minute podcast every every day into a video. And I don't even remember. I've got a an i5 processor on this. What but have those I got? are short Four, videos, right? Seven, they're, yeah, they're short. It takes yeah. seconds to, to render. Yeah. I suppose that they were long videos. If, it would trust take me, if you're doing, uh, you know, I got the uh, GoPro Fusion 360 camera. It takes eight hours to, to, to render wow. that video on a 10 core iMac Pro. Yes, that's right. There yeah. are things you do, and people yeah. do, a lot of people do, pros do, that do need that power. It's more than just the CPU, though. Stop stop focusing on the engine and start thinking about the gearbox and the suspension. The new generation of Intels will support um, faster SSD buses. Hopefully, we'll see some NVMe, maybe Does a, Optane a faster... make a difference? Optane, I think, well, is a big difference. And I think from Apple, if you think about it, this idea of 3D NAND replacing memory and SSDs or acting as a cache in the architecture should drive power consumption way down, in my opinion. Ah. And so that's instead another, of having a That's another hour, uh, spec that's yeah. very important, power consumption. Right. Yeah, yeah, so it's not, the, yeah. it's not the CPUs, although the extra performance would be good. There's also a whole bunch of modernization around how the CPU interfaces to the rest of the equipment. So SSDs, Optane memory, new DIMMs, new DIMM architectures that are more power efficient using smaller processors so they consume less power. Um, and it's all of that stuff, which is actually what we, we don't we don't need the CPU. But if you can get data in and out of the CPU faster or get deeper L3 buffers or whatever the current generation of features are in, in Ice Lake, then that's actually going to drive your experience. Everything feels snappier, even though you're still running right. at the same clock speed. And that's what we but want. I we want a better hardware. I, I, you've given me some hope because I really felt like Apple 
as a band in the pro market. But what may well be the fact is Apple knows that, well, when we can get an Optane system and when mm -hmm. we can get uh, uh, maybe a, a, you know, a six-core processor, this will be a pro system worthy of calling a Mac Pro. That's why that's yep. not going to be available till next year. And well, look at how popular external GPUs are with the enthusiast market. Everybody's right. getting a Mac, iMac, and they're hanging off. Right. And there's any number of YouTube articles of people hanging these yeah. external GPUs to get the features that because they want. Because they have well, such anemic GPUs in the current crop. And what's in the processor? The GPU is built onto the CPU die, right? Or they're using a generation of GPU from five years ago. Then the bus speed between the CPU and the GPU is too slow. That's why we want the new generation of CPUs that Intel hasn't delivered and isn't going to. So that's why I don't think we'll see hardware. If Apple, and I think it's too early for Apple to do ARMS, but I'm perfectly confident that Apple's sitting there in front of Intel saying, getting six months closer to an ARM CPU, you better get your finger out. Yeah. Yeah. Zach, does that There's other things that, that they could update as well. Like, you know, we saw recently a new Huawei uh, laptop with a kind of edge to edge screen. Isn't that a gorgeous laptop? That, that what is it, the Honor? It is. I, I'm not sold on the camera coming out of the keyboard thing, but uh, everything else looked pretty good. And then, well, you know, the mate, as, yeah. as you said, oh, yeah, the Mate. Yeah. And then the, um, yeah, so the, the, the ports on a, on MacBook, they could add, you know, like micro SD slot or, you know, God forbid, a USB-A port or, you know, there's a lot of things they can do. I'm, I'm you know, mm. I don't think that's going to happen, but um, I feel like there's a lot of things they could do to, to <laughs> get a new laptop out before uh, mid next year. If all year. they do is, I, is fucks with the keyboard and a few slots and an edge to edge screen, people are going to howl. Yep. People are just going to whine and say, "Why is this not fun? like the 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 chief nerds? You know, the loudmouths, the people like us who, you know, think we're just all going to say, why did they even bother?" So they're they're well, screwed either way they go because they're not willing to be open and say, "This is what we're doing. This is where we're heading." We're not, we know if they could just stand up and say, "This is the problem with bringing out a new laptop," and be honest about it instead of trying to come out with the the trash can, you know, Mac Pro type mistakes that they've made. And I wonder if they'll ever come out with a touchscreen Mac. No. I mean, that's something that I think they've been very unequivocal in saying yeah. no. Do you agree, Seth? I think the touchscreen Mac will be a iOS device yeah. that has a mm -hmm. keyboard. Yeah. Right. I mm -hmm. I don't think uh, the Mac line will ever go there. Yeah. No. This is the uh, the new Mate. Uh, look, I mean, this is look how thin it is, and I mean. Not, yeah, I mean, it looks exactly like a MacBook. So right, right. Why why can't Apple make that screen? Uh, it's a great question. Wow. Yeah. What's the power? What's the uh, battery life on that guy? You don't ask questions like that, uh, Larry. You just, you just, you just plunk down the credit card. Yeah. What's the battery mm. life? What the hell you care about that? Show, show the camera. <laughs> I really care about it. <laughs> <laughs> Tomorrow show the when, I'm at, when I'm at the WWDC and it's three hours into it and there's no power outlet, I'm going to care about the, the battery life. Yeah. My, yeah. Let me see. Laptop. Where was it? Come out of the. Come out of the screen. Mm. Let me see if I can find it. Comes a like out of the F6 key or something yeah, crazy. It's so silly. Uh, it's so thin. But the connectivity, you know, connectors does have a regular USB slot, which is interesting, as well as two Type Cs. Um, it can be done. I7 uh, processor. It's the uh, 8550U. That's not a not a bad processor. At the top of the line, discrete graphics card available if you wish. Uh, fifty-seven point four watt hour battery. That's a big. Twelve battery. hours of video. That is impressive. <laughs> that's a big. That's impressive. That's I a big battery. Now the only other question I can't afford to ask is how much it costs. This oh oh, there's the camera. There it is. Oh, hello, man. hello. Oh, that's weird. Hello. <laughs> so that's the weird. bottom of your neck <laughs> is going to be the the star of your videos yeah. now. <laughs> wow, that's uh, a non-starter. Are you wearing you gold chains? I. Uh, that's all I see. I. Move, move oh, it's fingers. a guy I with a man see. bun. So what does he care, right? He's, uh, <laughs> but he's a very assertive guy with a man bun, actually. He's just pointing that stylus like he means it. They all have man buns. What the hell's oh. going on with the hair here? <laughs> what? Uh, Who are you're going to end up with this. Uh, there's a thing going on on social media at the moment of bearded men looking straight up and then they're taking photos of themselves. Uh. It's the most disturbing thing. I put a link into the, sh into the chat room. What's under that beard? Yeah. No, they, they look... Put the heads right back and then take a photo of themselves from the from around oh, the Adam's apple. This is it's pretty funny. This is interesting, but it, I mean that's a problem with a ninety-one percent uh, screen. There's nowhere to put the camera. HP put it kind mm. of 
right at the bottom. Remember on the on the left there. I love the name Matebook. That's that's a Matebook. awfully yeah, kind of like MacBook, but not really. Uh, full size backlit chiclet keyboard. At least they say it's a chiclet. They admit it. Mm. Uh, it does look. But will the federal government let us buy these? Because this, they're made in China. Oh, probably Chinese not. Company. It's Huawei. It does mm. actually look a lot. Oh, it's got a fingerprint reader. It does lot look a lot like a MacBook, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. it's too bad it has to run Windows. Well, they all run the same chips. Right. They all have to look the same at the end of the day because they all run the same chips. They all run the same processors. They all run the same screens. Um, the only innovation that Apple got when they did their first generation was there's the used aluminium for the body uh, where everybody else was still making plastic so that they could rip customers off by giving them a cheap, shoddy product. Uh, and Apple sort of said, no, 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 if we gave them a steel, an aluminium case, we could do something better. And then, of course, people realized that, you know, actually aluminium cases were a good idea. And Apple had yeah, made yeah. the market because the challenge was with aluminium was how do you mill it? And there wasn't anybody with machines that let you mill al aluminium. It was much cheaper. You, in fact, you could only extrude alu uh, a plastic to make the case that you want. And so Apple gets out there, starts buying up these aluminium mi uh, milling machines, and lo and behold, aluminium cases become standard. So – that's that's the iteration there. Pricing is good on this, by the way. The MateBook X Pro i5 with 8 gigs of RAM and 256 gig uh, uh, SSD. Oh, yeah, that's it's good. 1,200 bucks and out of wow. stock. Somebody in the chat room saying that this is not a Chinese company. It's uh, from Taiwan. So that really that, that's okay. Huawei. Yeah, I'm I thought they were Chinese, uh, but I guess not. I'm surprised. That surprises me. <laughs> By the way, you got you got to love the tagline for this: the best laptop you've never heard of. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, Huawei is a Chinese company. That's what I thought too. Yeah, I we've so, had yeah. people people from our team go to China to to attend their conferences. I think they may have an office in Taiwan, and maybe even their head office. They may be raising capital out of Taiwan, but I'm not fairly confident they're not. I mean, just check their website. Well, they say they operate in 170 countries and serve more than a third of humanity. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, they made the six. That's right. They made the Nexus 6P. I forgot about that. I'm trying to find their. I have a broken Huawei phone right here. It's yeah. actually an Honor, but I think Huawei makes the Honor. Yeah, the, yeah I think it's made in China. I feel like recently uh, AT&T and Verizon didn't sell Huawei phones because the government the U.S. government uh, kind of convinced them behind the scenes not to. So right. I feel like that's, that's kind right. of China. That's right. They were all set to get into AT&T and Verizon, and then they, the plug was pulled. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. It's headquartered in Shenzhen, Guangdong. There you mm -hmm. go. Mm -hmm. There you go. So that's why I, I should never listen to the chat room. <laughs> in, in a no, I, I think he's uh, like. There's a lot of stuff that comes out of Taiwan. It's very difficult to pick the difference between. I always have to go and look these things up. Um, but it's very much a, a Chinese arm of the government. Uh, as somebody's saying in the chat room, Huawei was founded by a former engineer from the PLA, the ah, Chinese arm. Chinese That's army. okay. Everything yeah. that comes out of Israel's is ex-armed forces, so right. don't get too panicked. So WWDC tomorrow will be really. It's funny. I was looking back at last year. They announced the HomePod, mm -hmm. shipped it like almost a year later. They announced uh, AirPlay 2, shipped it almost exactly a year later, last week. They announced iCloud uh, Messages, Apple Messages and iCloud, shipped that last week. Uh, and the iMac Pro, they did have some hardware. They had the iMac Pro. And did I think they did the, the, did they do the iPad Pro 10.5? Maybe not. But the oh. iMac Pro, they shipped there. So they did announce some hardware. Didn't get a lot of it out for a long time. Yeah, they, they, they've been known to announce hardware at WWDC. A lot of times yeah. you'll hear people say, it's a developer's conference. It should be software only. But they've throughout their history, they've yeah. released tons of hardware at, at WWDC. Not even so it's specifically not, uh, necessarily developer hardware. It's uh, when you, you right. know, you, this is a bully pulpit. A lot of people are paying attention. Why not use this uh, to announce something? So. Yeah, and, and the March event wasn't that exciting. It was mostly education. So, um, you know, the and Chicago. a bargain I've been, yeah. So like it's already been half a year now and since, and Apple hasn't released anything. It's been more, it's been more like eight months since, uh, the, the last iPhone announcement. But, you know, my so, audience mostly cares when they do the iPhone announcement. That's when, yes. that's when people get excited yes. when, the, when the iPhone comes out. It's because your I, audience is a hundred years old. 
My audience is at least 100. They all use a <laughs> microphone that I showed you earlier. <laughs> no, I'm so, just teasing. So Your audience is normal people is the point. They're yeah. normal what people. What could they announce in hardware that would actually move the needle? Like the difference between the iPhone this year to last year is about 5% better. Um, mm -hmm. You know, arguably the performance is a bit better, but I don't think people notice. Um, the effect of face recognition is, you know, eh. The camera, you know, the multiple cameras, everybody's got that now. Um, you know, if they come out with the – there's a, an article here from Mac Rumors talking about triple lens cameras. Um, you know, like, uh, again, good to have, nice to have. I will I'm say buy phone, that was, but I'm not going to really get one. That was sourced from an analyst who seemed like he was guessing. Uh, it was a Chinese, <laughs> a Chinese <laughs> report, and it, it was saying something like, you know, if you read the the, the Chinese part of it, it was like – Things that could happen, but we have no idea, and so <laughs> we didn't run with that particular story. I, I think I think Apple's doubling down on software-driven photography. They're saying that if I use smart, like the portrait mode in the iPhone 8 that I have, is just extraordinary. But that's not a lens. That's not me changing from a you know 50 mil nifty 50 to a to a 24 millimeter lens or something like that. That's just put the phone up, then the software does some processing, and boom, I've got a portrait mode. Um, I think we're going to see much more in the software, much less improvement on the hardware. Where, where do they go? What do they do? Put a bigger, power, bigger, faster CPU in with a better GPU and more memory? I mean, Actually, I think announce... they have the same problem with the software. It's hard. It's hard. We're we're, we're at such peak f phone you know, at yeah. this point. It's hard to think of what you would do to make the software significant. I mean, it's sort of like look at Microsoft, which you know until recently was only a software company. They go from Office X to Office X Y. And I, you know, I'm a heavy office user and I can barely tell the difference between yeah. the current version, the version that came out 12, We're 15 kind of years at that ago. point now. You know, with, you just get to a point where it's cl so close to perfect. Or you at least you guys, you know? Seth, you guys at 9 to 5 Mac had actually Stephen Trout and Smith posted it. Uh, and then you guys posted the video, which Apple immediately. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, even it's streamable, which is like. You know, the NBA can't get stuff down from streamable <laughs> Pull, and pulled it and down, baby. <laughs> pulled it down pretty quick too, like uh, at like a.m. in the morning. Yeah, fortunately, uh, there were some screenshots, and it looks like the big feature which Apple will announce tomorrow for Mac OS 10.14. Uh, you guys uh, maybe thought it might be Mojave because there seems to be dunes on the screen in the right. background. Mac OS 10 Mojave. The big feature will be dark mode. You know, the, the people love the dark mode. Yeah, but really, I how much programming mode. time does it take to do, to do dark mode? I believe that's a yeah. bit. I'm thinking yeah, it's just a bit. All colors. <laughs> you got to do all the colors new. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I, I Apple News will be on the Apple News will be on the desktop now. Um, that's to on the me, Mac desktop. Yeah, that's nothing to jump up and down about at all. What about augmented reality? How? I mean, mm. I, personally, augmented reality to me is a bit of a yawn. It's going to be like 3D TVs. I think it's going to be like a decade before that comes anywhere. But do you think Apple's going to try and do a song and dance around AR and then pretend that it actually matters? Uh, I think they will try to do a song and dance around AR. I think that's kind of their what they're focusing on right now. Um, you know, we've seen like you know where you point your camera around. Even at Google I/O uh, last month, uh, Google demonstrated a bunch of cool stuff they added ar to maps camera. which is actually a useful feature very useful yeah so i think apple's not going to seed the lead in ar and, and there was that reuters report about um you know end-to-end -end ar stuff where uh you you're sharing an ar screen with somebody else and it's not bouncing off any servers so i mean i think there's some room to improve there there's some room to be creative and show some really cool stuff i don't think uh you know i don't think Apple's going to seed that AR lead they have to Google anytime soon, no. and 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 that may even affect their hardware in the the short term with the. But to me, the, the big question is, is is AR going to be a a a headset player that going to be something that just is augmented with the screens of whatever flat device you're carrying in your pocket or in your in your backpack? I mean, I I just came back from AWE, which is augmented what is it augmented world expo, and. Um, I, I saw a lot of products that did not require a headset. They just ran off of phones and uh, and tablets. 
In a way, that's really what Apple did a year ago at WWDC. They announced AR Kit and they showed a lot of apps with it. And ironically, it didn't use the fancy array facing you that uh, would have made a much better AR tool set. They used just a regular camera on yeah. the back. Google, which had a very fancy, elaborate, hardware-based AR platform called Tango, sure. took one look at the success Apple had with this kind of bogus AR kit because it, you know, stuff doesn't quite sit on the surface. I mean, it's 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 okay, it's adequate, and they said, "Oh crap, Tango was no, <laughs> we wasted all that time." So they made AR Core, which is basically an Android version of AR Kit, and and um, I agree with you, Greg. I thought I think what we're seeing, the the AR we're seeing today is to headset-based real AR, HoloLens-like real AR, as today's mm. artificial intelligence is to hell 9,000. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's, it is a long... I think, I think real AR is a long way off, and that's acknowledgement from the companies, Apple and Google chiefly. They, they got nothing, so they're going to do this. Uh, yeah, a lot of the times these Silicon Valley companies like to tie their shoelaces and then trip over themselves. Yeah. Um, you know, their idea of being useful is to do something and then pretend it's awesome. And then when everybody ignores them, they go, well, you didn't like my baby yeah. and have a good cry like Facebook does every other week. Yeah. Um, I, I just feel like AR is is something that's it's going to be useful, but nobody actually knows what it's useful for. Well, I, um, you know, let, like, let, let, look at Google Glass, right? Google Glass uh, is actually now joke. continues on. Uh, it's right. a, it, what it is a joke for any normal use case, but uh, there are several industries that use Google Glass for mammoth tasks, medical in particular, sure. where there's massive stuff actually happening. And in ten or twenty years, maybe the Google Glass thing will turn around and come back into the consumer market. But I, I don't I know don't if it'll be so. that long, but it's at least five yeah. years off. I mean, Vuex yeah, I mean, and, and, has an, has incredible industrial applications. You know. Boeing and airlines using it to rearrange the yeah, seats on an airliner. This isn't even so that new. You can look down. They well, I went to the design yeah. labs at Ford eight years ago. We we did coverage, and they were using VR helmets to design to look at what it looks like to be inside a car they haven't built yet. This isn't new. Mm. This right. is not. This has been around forever and ever and ever, and it's nothing spe spectacular. There's a lot of issues that have to be solved: battery issues, power issues, before you can have real augmented reality. In a way and whether people oh. are going to, whether they can build these things so that they're non-obtrusive. I mean, whether they can be just and essentially ad, adjuncts to your glasses. Yeah, because that that's why Google wear, Glass became a punchline because you looked like right. a moron. Right. Mm. Uh, well, the right. people and, who are wearing we do know that Apple is working on can, AR glasses. Yeah. Yes, of course they are. Yeah. But but what's so what do you know? What is the time frame for that? Uh, I I don't know anything specific, but um, the fact that you know Apple's hiring people and and you know that. They're they're talking internally about it. I think it's a couple years away, like yeah. two or three years. Tim yeah. Cook's been saying AR, AR, AR for two years. You know, he's he's right. you know he's been really pushing it now. But that, so so Apple's going to announce. You 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 said this, Seth. I don't still don't get it. <laughs> they're going to let they're going to have tools that let two iPhones share augmented reality without storing it in the cloud. I can't wait to hear Larry Maggot explain this to people on CBS <laughs> News Radio. What I don't even know what that means myself. What is that even? Who wants that? What do we? What does it mean? What does it look like? Uh, I, I think it would peer -to -peer be peer kind of like right? well, no, FaceTime I, with AR. I don't know. <laughs> oh, you, you mean that thing where you could put little dog ears and a tongue on your face while you're talking to somebody? That maybe, maybe you an emoji FaceTime. Animoji is quite I, popular with the uh, well, kids I think, today. Yeah. Is it? I, I, is it really? I don't know. Seth, do you I know any it. kids? I, I hope not. <laughs> I think they're reaching for a use case. So if you had your smartphone and, you know, you're looking through here, you know, and, and looking at a game on a desktop and you're playing it by yourself, that's kind of not very interesting. Why not just play a game on a screen? Why would you map out an AR and watch the orc go in and stamp the guy with a wand or whatever it is? But if you can get three or four people standing around a table holding their – but, again, you know, when you think about it, if you're holding your phone like this while you're doing a game, your arms get tired. That's why we have computers, so you sit down at a desk and play a game for hours. And, and not to mention Pokemon Go, which, of course, came out with AR without having to get help from Apple and, and Android, what, two That's years ago? That's not AR. Yeah, well, but it, it, is, it is, it is, and it isn't. It's a tease of AR. I mean, they are superimposing computer graphics over the yeah. real world. So I yeah. don't know what you call that other than AR. It's a type of AR. It's primitive AR. 
But, but it's putting that, a picture. It's putting a picture over the top of your camera. There's a camera yeah. image coming on, and it just put the Pokemon graphic on top. It's not like it was, you know, dynamically but generated. Honestly, it was a static image on top of the camera. Honestly, mm -hmm. most of the AR kit apps, that's exactly what they're doing. What it is. Yeah, no, it's, it's, a, it's such a trivial use case that I just don't I, – I, 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 so I Seth, think it's – you brought hmm. this up. What does phone-to-phone -phone AR mean? I don't even know what that means. So, like I said, I, I don't know what it means, but <laughs> I imagine that – the phone to phone thing is that so you're doing whatever you're doing and you're worried about the government looking at it and Apple says, hey, we don't have any knowledge of this because it's phone to phone. So don't, don't you know, what ask are you us. doing with that the government has no knowledge over? Why you should got, the government right. care? You got ears <laughs> and a tongue. And when you open your mouth, rainbows come out. Oh. Right. Bob and, Baller is you know, really going to be interested in that one. <laughs> <laughs> this, uh, Donald this Trump really can talk to his lawyer. Face. Yeah. What's funny is they're all just playing catch up to Snapchat, which has been doing this for the ages. Yeah, right. They've exactly. got their own glasses now, right? They've got the second generation of their of their goggles or whatever. I have still it. have my Snapchat spectacles. goggles. Yeah. I still have those spectacles. I think all money. This article that you refer to, Leo, sounds like uh, it's uh, just augmented reality shared between two iPhones. Is the logical progression of having it on one phone so that more than one person it's can play twice the game? As good. So, but this, but whoever is writing the articles run it through a privacy filter and gone. <laughs> it's it, it's an anti Facebook article, you know, banging well, on about privacy. Like who gives well, a rats? No. What was the event? Was it the uh, was it the iPhone event where they showed off some augmented reality games? Uh, it was a recent I, a, Apple event. This and was this was all at WWDC last. Was it that June. long ago? Yeah. God, it's, it's, it, so I mean, there is obviously a gaming application that one can envision that would be a two iPhone. It, it was such a augmented toy. Reality. Every yeah. developer, because they, as soon as they got AR Kit, wrote their AR app. Their yeah. Twitter was filled with these AR Kit based mm -hmm. apps. Oh, that's cool! And then that was that. It's not. Yeah, <laughs> that was it. Was a, well, <laughs> that's how I. You know, I, feel, I got both. I, of, like I got both some... of the standalone VR headsets that came out recently: the Oculus and the Lenovo. And I had 15 minutes of fun with each one of them, and they they've all been on the shelf since. Of fun. That's about all I. That's, about it was that's the story of the show. Of exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Fifteen your... minutes of fun, baby. We're going to take a break and come back with our another <laughs> another fifteen minutes of fun. Greg Farrow is here. Title. It's so, it's so great to have you, Greg, from a Packet Pushers Network. Seth Weintraub, first time ever. Great to have you. I want to talk electric cars in a little bit and what's going on at Tesla. He's a publisher not only of Electric.com but Nine to Five Mac, Nine to Five Google. And his newest one, uh, draw, uh, what was it? Uh, drone, drone DJ. DJ dot com. Cool. And, of course, Larry Magid, the one and the only, who's been on Twit more than probably anybody else in years. Oh. You're, you're, you've are you're you been with us since practically the beginning. CBS practically. News Radio, connectsafely.org. Larry and I have gotten gray together. We have. Yes. Our show today brought to you by the source of of my favorite thing in the world, a good night's sleep. <laughs> There's literally nothing better. Maybe it's just me at my age and my stress level, but if I've had a good night's sleep, I feel like I got this is as good as it gets. This is everything. Casper is there to bring you a lovely, exceptionally comfortable sleep experience one night at a time. Casper is the first. They really created this the online retailer of premium mattresses for a fraction of the cost by eliminating the single biggest inefficiency in mattresses, the middleman. They cut the cost of dealing with resellers, of showrooms. They sell directly to you, and the savings go right in your pocket. And boy, are these great mattresses. Obsessively engineered. I mean, the original Casper mattress has, this is actually the one I like, multiple supportive memory foams, for a sleep surface that somehow magically gives you just the right sink, but also just the right bounce. It gives, but it's firm. It's like the perfect mattress. It's breathable design, lets you sleep cool. That's important in these hot summer nights. And lets you regulate your temperature through the night. Long-lasting comfort and support. You buy it online, and because they know you, you, know, you didn't get to try before you buy, 100 nights, risk-free returns. No cost to you if at any time in the first 100 days you decide you don't want it. They come, they get the mattress, they refund you every penny. They're, that is the best guarantee in the business. Free delivery, painless returns, 
uh, shipping is free and returns are free in the U.S., in the in Canada, and the U.K. now, Greg Farrow. Casper mattresses uphold the highest environmental production standards. They're, they're coming in a surprisingly compact box. You open it up, whoosh, it, it whoosh, springs to life. Get a Casper mattress today. You can save $50 on select mattresses if you go to Casper, C-A-S-P-E-R dot com slash twit. Use the promo code twit at checkout to save $50 on select mattresses. Terms and conditions apply. That's casper.com with slash twit and use the promo code twit to save 50 schmeckers. Good news. What's that? In the UK? Good news. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because uh, mattresses is one of those things that's really hard to get sorted out in a place where uh, we don't have big roads and very few people have cars big enough to put mattresses in them. The home delivery thing is actually really quite useful. I always laugh because yeah. I don't know why people don't know this, but I see this every once in a while driving down the highway. Somebody has strapped a mattress to their car roof. Yeah. And you just know oh, as soon as you hit 60 miles an hour, it's going to catch <laughs> the wind and that's yeah. flying off. There's nothing that will hold that on there. Nothing. Exactly, yeah. yeah and yeah. that's why you see mattresses in the road. Mm. Dopes. Or oh, they're tied on the roof and they're Dopes. bent back in half. Yeah, yeah, the roof is open like a <laughs> can opener. Dopes. Yep. Dope. All right. All right. No more, uh, no more Apple. I think we've done, I think we've got all the uh, Apple stuff mm. here that we need. I think to. it's all going to be software and and content. Everybody's gonna, you know where yeah, Apple's really it, actually starting to make money is in services, and that that really is content because it's the App Store, it's Apple Music, it's iCloud to some degree. They never break it down, so we don't know how much. But mm. uh, it was almost ten billion dollars last quarter. It's uh, it. The, I'll give you yep. an idea. The Apple services revenue was more than Mac and iPad combined. It's yep. their number two revenue generator. It is the number two revenue generator, but the thing that strikes me about the App Store generally um, is, A, how much money the games make. There were some numbers around games. It's just oh, it's astonishing. Amazing. amazing how much money they're making out of those games. But also the fact that the ecosystem of the developers is collapsing. So the developers are saying, we can't survive as is. It originally came out as like this great big independent, uh, you know, indie developers. But Apple's got this platform squeezed so tight um, that if you're trying to build a business on top of it, you're never going to win because Apple's got this paranoia that if anybody can make more money out of the platform than they can, then they lose control. Like you remember, so Microsoft Office and, and Windows, the idea behind Windows was that we enable other people to make more money than we do. So the more people using Windows, the more money other people make, and we get dragged along behind them. So our platform follows those people. In Apple's case, they say, this is our platform. We own it. You can't have it. Right, and you have to live with the the consequences of what you get, and uh, it's up to you to decide, you know, whether you want to be on it. But we don't actually let you survive, so you we don't actually care about you. It's all all about yes, it. but there's so much money to be made. People put up with it. Look at this. This is from Statista. I, you know, Apple yeah. doesn't Apple doesn't break this down, but this is from Statista. The top grossing iPhone mobile app in the U.S. as of April 2018 is Fortnite. Now you look at this mm -hmm. number, one point nine million dollars, and you think, well, how? That's per day. Wow, that's sure. per, almost two Revenue, million that's like dollars. My kids and their classmates are doing that day. I know it's a great game, yeah. and you know what? It's a free game. It's free, and they're making wow. one point nine million dollars a day. And you know what they're yeah. selling? Stupid digital goods, costumes. Yeah. So not exactly an innovation. One Not exactly Candy Crush changer. Saga, one point three million dollars no. a day. Pokemon yep. Go, almost a million dollars a day. Yep. So and this Apple is gets why people percent of that. Yeah. Well, by yeah. the way, that's where you get ten billion dollars in revenue because Apple gets a third mm. of it. Yep. And I, I think what that highlights is just how bad the competition is. Why is it that Google is so bad at Android that they haven't got an app store that could do better than this? Why well, haven't we they don't, done that? You know what? what? I don't know that they're not doing better than this. There probably aren't because Apple. Traditionally, Apple users are willing to spend more, but I think that the Google app Android store is not a complete laggard. I, uh, let me see if I can find numbers for that. Sure, Google's I mean, not they, broke. You know, no, and nor, nor is nor is does does Aunt, does Google take the same percentage from uh, Android store sales? No, I believe so. At um, thirty percent, I think uh, they had some like they gave some other things a cut, like the carriers or 
or something Isn't else. Isn't there a difference in in-app purchases that Apple takes a cut and Google allows you to do your own in-app thing without going through them? I remember there was some issue with it. It is a lot less. Kindle. Same source, yeah. leading Android apps in the Google Play Store worldwide by revenue. Whoops. Mm -hmm. Candy Crush Saga, number one, 45 million. Oh, yeah. pennies. And so it's yeah. like a 20th, really. Yeah. Mm. Um, and, still. And Fortnite isn't even on Android yet. Mm. Not yet. But still, mm. honestly, yeah, 45 million dollars a day. I'd take it. I mean, I'm not going to say no. Yeah. I mean, it's good money in terms of because a handful of develop, you know, a handful of kids sitting around computers whipping up some some crazy graphics means it's an enormously actually, profitable business. It's Candy Crush Saga, so it's actually yeah. Grandma that's pumping money yeah. into that one. Probably, but I mean, the product <laughs> that you're kids. generating here is trivial. The thing that makes me sad is, first of all, it's it's absolutely trivial. None of these things are changing the world. Why is it not? People doing business on this phone. Why are there no business apps here that actually make real money? Well, it's always been that way. Do... Come on. That's the way the world is. Yeah, but, you know, what I'm going to have a bit of a whine. I'm going to get up here on my hobby horse and ride it around and, and say, you know, like, this is not changing the world. This is a bunch of people playing stupid games. They're not improving their lives or brain training. At least, I mean, brain training was rubbish, but at least people were trying or <laughs> pretending that they were improving the world of themselves. Right? They've just given up. Now they're playing Clash they're of Clans. Now they're just playing yeah. Fortnite, yeah. you know, or Clash of Clans or some other yeah. stupid thing. I mean, <laughs> this isn't really like this is. You've, you're, we're having arguments about how rubbish Facebook is. This reminds me of Newton, Newton, you know, in the vat, when he called television the vast wasteland. Yeah. I mean, it's the same, yeah. same story, right? Yeah. I mean, that's it's what I'm saying. Technology. It's always been that way. Mass, mass products, yeah, yeah. mass appeal products. They're not changing the world. Yeah. For crying out well, loud. I mean, sure. cup of noodles? Come on. <laughs> Ramen. <laughs> Ramen? Ramen? Come on. I mean, <laughs> life has always been that way. Because cooking food is hard. You yeah. Know. <laughs> uh, Facebook is removing trending topics. Yeah. What? This was, uh, this was the intractable uh, problem they couldn't solve, which was basically the fake news problem, right? The trending the, topics. It, it couldn't the, be done with humans. News. The fake accusations from conservatives that there is bias and the fact that nobody looks at them to begin with. I I had to go out of my way to, to remember where they were on my Oh, really? Screen. You didn't know. I, how, whoever looks at those damn things. Apparently, 1.5% of publisher clicks come from trending news. So, trending, so it, it, it's essentially a non-product to begin with that's caused them nothing but anguish thanks to all the controversy. So why not get rid of it? Yeah, actually, if we hadn't told people it was going away, they may have exactly. never, exactly. never, ever noticed let me just see what's trending today. Right. It's on the right, I, by the way, yeah, if you haven't looked. Yeah. Yeah. For, uh, whoops. It's re, it's Oh, the page is still building, and now it's pushed down here. Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, Douglas High School honored, honoring its uh, shooting victims. That's Dallas right. woman says she killed her husband for beating their pet cat. <laughs> and a suspect is arrested after sh shooting in San Diego. And look. <laughs> A big announcement from Facebook. We're removing yeah. trending news soon to make way for future news. After We're actually destroying your house to make way for a inters interspace bypass yeah. or whatever it was, right? Yeah. I think <laughs> Nobody sit in front of this the... bulldozer, I can tell you right now. <laughs> I think this is related Hyperspace to the article bypass. we've got further down here from Chartbeat. And Chartbeat is a company that puts analytics inside of web pages. And what they're now saying is that news sites are now getting more traffic direct on mobile phones than they are via Facebook. So over the last five years, we've seen news sites say that they want Facebook to send them traffic. And what they've realized is they actually just start telling people to come directly to their sites. People will. Yeah. And so now that the split has happened where the majority of people used Facebook to get the news, now they're going directly to people's to the brand's websites. And As they're all getting Google very news. excited about it. I, I see. I usually, I, I'm still a heavy Google News user, to, to you know, on my especially on my mobile. I like and the new go Google. Be honest with you, uh, the new Google News beats Apple News. Beats uh, it's it's actually. If I show you my uh, phone, it's on the front page of my phone. It's uh, I really like it. And their algorithms are good. Yeah, and they're well. They do something I think is uh, is admirable, and they 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 trumpeted this. If you'll forgive the inadvertent mm -hmm. pun they trumpeted this at uh, google io they said we're gonna uh, there's gonna be leo's briefing you know there's the the top five stories for leo 
But then everything else, the headlines, everybody who re reads it will get the same headlines. Which you, I think is absolutely essential. We're not going to do the algorithm on news. Right. And I think that's right. actually really admirable. I agree. That's probably I, the real story here is the failure of algorithms. Yeah. I well, call AI, I said AI from now on, it stands for algorithmic idiocy. Well, <laughs> the, the fact is that the idea of tailoring, tailoring news around your biases, basically. Yeah. To me, uh, what it, could it, go it, wrong? It's a challenge to democracy, right? <laughs> You're conservative, you get conservative news. You're liberal, you get liberal news. How does that help us resolve any of our problems? Seth, you probably know better than anybody. How much tra What's the most? What are important traffic drivers for your your publications? Uh, so in this space, Apple News is clearly a big one. Um, Flipboard, strangely or not strangely. Well, uh, Flipboard's still huge on, uh, on iOS, right? I mean, it's on Android, right. but I think it's huge on iOS. Yeah. Right. And then, you know, obviously Google News and then, you know, all the search, different search, uh, it basically but the different Facebook? ways Google sends traffic. Facebook is in, and Twitter are both kind of middle ground. We don't, we don't, we never invested in any kind of Facebook anything right. because I kind of felt like Facebook wasn't really our buddy. Um, they didn't really you were seem very like. very right, you know, weren't you? You turned out to be right when everybody else yeah. chased Facebook. Yeah. I mean, Facebook was also handing out a lot of cash to some uh, publishers to to work with them so you know it wasn't it wasn't dumb I, I i probably if somebody gave me you know half a million dollars i would have probably done some facebook videos but um you know we still push out to facebook we didn't you know delete facebook or anything but um it, and we do have an audience there i think we have like three hundred thousand people on nine to five mac and and you know a few less on the other sites so we're, you know, we use Facebook like everybody else, but we don't really promote it. Um, we don't say, hey, you know, go to our Facebook page or anything like that. Yeah, we did the, uh, Twit did the same thing on a much smaller scale than you guys, but Twit did the same thing with both YouTube and Facebook. I never really trusted either of those platforms uh, to look out for my own best interest. Just as you said, Greg, uh, they're not. Yeah, they're not. They're not. I never well, quite um, understood why people push their Facebook pages over their own websites. I mean, you know, yeah. you control twit.com. I mean, that you own right. that. Right. And and <laughs> actually, I don't, but I control twit.tv. TV. Yeah. I don't know who has twit.com. <laughs> sorry, sorry about that. But you know, yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I know. Yeah. Why? Why? I think, uh, I think a lot of them Facebook got page. onto Facebook because they got analytics that worked, and it was all because you know a bunch of smart developers at Facebook put some analytics. So when people went to the page, you could see people coming from the page and then coming to your website, and that made you feel like you're in control. It was a false dawn, of course, because nowadays these these publishers are realizing they have to build their own technology and they're hiring the same developers. They're building their own code. They're building out, they're ditching their old 40-year-old content management systems and growing up and getting something a bit modern. And now the analytics engines that they have are of a quality that well, they should have had 10 years ago. They have to be technology companies. And they've kind of been through this, you know, oh, we'll get Facebook to do it for us. We'll get Facebook to do our ads. We'll get Google to do our ads. And then realizing that was the dumbest thing we ever did. We've got to take it all in-house. I'm going to, this is, uh, I'm going to be apostate here and say I'm not convinced that analytics are all that useful either. I think that that's become, no. in, in a similar way, that's become a um, kind of a religious, you know. Uh, illusion of control. Believe, you yes, think you're it's in an control, illusion. But you're not. It's yeah. an illusion. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, we look at, we get analytics, we look at analytics, but uh, I, I think from a point of view of advertisers, I, I understand, you know, advertisers know their, that at least half of their money is wasted. They just they, don't know which half. They just don't know which half <laughs> right. in the old, in the old saying. Uh, but that's the same. But, as and they're trying to figure it out. I don't blame them. They want their ads to be more efficient, but ultimately, I don't know if analytics are the holy grail either. It's, it, it's an illusion of control. They sold the vision of I can track every click, I can, can track every impression, and that's going to be better than what you're doing now. And, of course, what we're seeing, of course, is big consumer brands pull out and go back to television and radio. They're right. pulling out of YouTube. Isn't that interesting? Pulling out of, yeah. Because they're not getting the traction that they want. Yes, they can. The only time that targeted advertising works is when you're really trying to reach a really specific audience like the poli like the political one. So if you're trying to get somebody who lives in a suburb of, you know, like if you're trying to target people who live in Cheltenham in the UK where I live and you just want people who are in the upper echelon and you want to target them with your um, high-end clothing brand, 
well, you know, these types of analytics-driven systems are perfect. But if you're Procter & Gamble and you're trying to promote, you know, washing liquid or something like that, why why are you on Facebook? I, I, I don't think that's actually useful overall. Well, I think that's an example of the analytics persuaded mm. them. But I think we're, the analytics is a shibboleth. People are... People treat it as if it's, you know, the holy grail for yeah. advertising is turning out not to be, I don't think, all that useful. I guess if you're a seller, it's really slave. interesting. The big, I had not heard this. Big brands are turning, are going back to their brand yes. advertising on mainstream media. Yeah, they're media. definitely pulling out of, they're winding back presence. Like Cisco, for example, has backed off YouTube completely. Uh, they're no longer doing any ads on YouTube. Well, they're that completely I understand. Can, I mean, yeah. YouTube is the biggest uh, a scam in history. <laughs> if I have I mean, to watch another Wix ad, I swear I'm going to put something <laughs> through my screen. I mean, but the 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 challenge I think with the is the illusion of control. And remember, a lot of the times that you they put these ads on these platforms, and there's some salary slave there with a high school education who's looking at an analytics platform trying to justify their reason for earning minimum wage in an office job that's pretty cool. Uh, you know, it's a good job. They don't have to do a whole lot of work. They just have to put some ads on a platform and pretend. And if you can click a button and show that you did 10% better than you did last month, well, hello, you know, job done. I, I'm a legend. Give me a pay rise. But it's, it's interesting because, uh, I mean, in a way, the reason we have GDPR is because of, you know, the, the, the European privacy regulations is because of ad tech and the, and the concern of consumers that they're being – tracked and surveilled by companies and really the reason companies track and surveil them is for targeted advertising and would it be ironic if advertising targeting didn't work and so the whole thing brought the house down um for no good reason that you know i don't know uh, seth do you have an you must have an opinion on this god you've been you've been yeah you've been so doing this for ages. i do yeah so i i think there is some value to targeted advertising, um, specifically as you you know kind of pare down. You're right, the Procter and Gamble stuff that everybody needs maybe doesn't make sense for. But uh, for instance, iPhone cases, like what's a good place to advertise iPhone cases? Probably nine to five Mac, you know, or or you know Apple sites. Um, so like but you could do that without that, that, you could do that without targeted advertising because you know you, Mac you, users you, are going to yeah, go nine to five ads. That's what that's, we don't that's easy. we don't. We don't yeah. do any analytics on our audience. We yeah. don't have to. We just say, you want to reach tech enthusiasts? Exactly. 9 to 5 Mac. You want to reach Mac users? Where else are you going to go? I mean, that's perfect. So, you want to reach old people? Evening news. But I, I mean, bet it's, you, it's, Seth, it's your advertisers still come to you and say, well, I want to see some <laughs> analytics. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, that that it's it's crazy because they have these R ROI budgets that they can't, right. like, escape out of their right. brains. Right. So. They come in and they say, well, you know, I don't, we need to make, you know, and they track the people from like our site to their site to the cash register and do they make a purchase? Right. And then they come back and they're like, well, we didn't really make, you know, exactly what we paid you or we, we you know, oh. whatever. And I'm just kind of like, well, you know, like, <laughs> oh, you got a lot of eyes. Yeah. I don't know if that <laughs> makes any. Did you sell some cases? Just monetize. tell me. Yeah. Did you sell? You know, we and all of our ads are thing. direct response ads, which is why you hear in an ad, you'll have a custom URL or a promo code and all of that. And, and <laughs> it, I shouldn't say this out loud, but so <laughs> advertisers, sometimes we'll get advertisers say, well, this show doesn't work. And we say, oh, what do you, all the promo codes I'm getting are Twit. Yeah, but you didn't even buy ads on Twit. You bought ads on that other show. So honestly, if you're getting ads, <laughs> promo codes from Twit, that's us. That's that show. And they, <laughs> and they don't know, but it doesn't match. It's, uh, and yeah, there's a lot of that. There's way, yeah. way yep. more of that than I'd like to <laughs> acknowledge or admit. That's hard. Um, ultimately, for an advertiser, the, yeah. it's of course. And I'm, look, I'm a business person. You're going to spend money on advertising. You have to do that. You hope that that will make you more money than you spent. That's the real ROI. And if if you sold more iPhone cases than it cost you to buy the ads on nine to five Mac, I think that's a success, regardless of what the analytics tell you. But they want more. Absolutely. Than that, I guess right. Yeah. Well, they they just want like they want their computers spreadsheet to right. like look you know and you know like we, you know we did an ad or, or something and maybe some people didn't enter the promo code or some people like came back a day later or a week later and made a purchase or left it in their cart or right. a million other right. different scenarios right and if it doesn't match 100 percent, then they're like well i don't know if we can do this again or something yeah. and i'm always like it's not just it's not just this tracking stuff there's like more to it like it's about the brand it's about the 
awareness. It took six and, months and, until they buy something. You know, yeah, exactly. We, we've had that problem so, where, where two years later, after a podcast went through, customer rocks up in front of a. Now we work in enterprise IT at Packet Pushes, so we're a bit different game. But we've had people turn up to the vendor two years later and say, "I heard your show two years ago. Yeah. I've been putting a project together. Yeah. And now we're ready to go." Yeah, right? you don't get any credit exactly. for that. Yeah. Yep. My favourite one, Seth, and you'll have done this, is next time somebody says to you, I didn't get any ROI, my favourite one is to say, well, maybe your product's junk. Yes. Nobody wants I it. can't help you there. Like, I can't <laughs> help you if your product's not worth buying. I can't help you. All we can do, we can lead a horse to water. We can't make them buy those Instagram shorts that yeah, I bought last yeah, night. Yeah, that's right. So maybe don't say that out loud, but you can think it in your inside voice or something. But, no, right? all of our products I did actually that we sell are perfect. Yes. <laughs> actually, we turn down products that I don't support so that is one thing yeah but we, I'm, I'm in the same boat we don't have a lot of ads so it's an easy thing to do uh i don't but yeah yeah you don't want to yeah, do I mean, ads like, for stuff for belly fat on nine to five mac yeah or even well, I have, like i have no me, idea like what ads they're going to wrap around my stuff always makes sense right for us. right no i think that that's uh it's unfortunate because what's happened really is that because of the fetishes fetishization of 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 numbers that really most digital advertising now goes through you, Google and Facebook. I mean, they have something like 80% of the market because they can yeah. produce that kind of, you know, they can really fill your spreadsheet with stuff. Yeah. Yep. Doesn't mean they're better, uh, but just they can <laughs> fill your spreadsheet with stuff. We have customers coming in working with Packet Pushes Network. And the reason that they deal with us is because we don't do analytics driven marketing. Good for you. So we. Yeah. We won't target. We don't. But do, we can do that we, too. You and I can do that because we're small. Yep. We're niches. Uh, we are very specific niche. Yeah. Meanwhile, teens, according to TechCrunch, are dumping Facebook for YouTube, Instagram, and Snapchat. Actually, it's according to Pew. Pew. Pew does these great surveys. Uh, the Pew. Uh, what is it? American Life. Pew. Uh, Pew Internet Research. Yeah. They yeah, do they, great. Pew, Pew Research Center. Good. They do great stuff. Yeah. So that's also the lead story on, on Larry's world.com, which is Facebook slips out Snapchat grows among teens. But the real big issue on that story, the real shocker in some ways is that half 45 percent of the kids are online almost constantly when you ask them how long they're online, which is what. The and, and then what? if you add you add the ones that are online several times a day, I think it comes to 89 percent of teens are Jeez. online either constantly or several times a day. So that's a, that's a huge that amount. And Whatever also in the in the environment where they have mixed feelings about how you know yeah. they they feel about social media, twenty four percent say it's mostly negative, only thirty one percent say it's mostly positive. Um, yeah. So, but nevertheless, forty five percent of teens spend are <laughs> I don't know what almost constantly yeah, or virtually I, I, constantly. I, I actually. I have a podcast with the author um, of that, which again, you'll find on Larry's World. And I couldn't get her to actually define what almost constantly means other than they keep looking at their phone. Yeah, there's the podcast right on top. Yeah, but who's not almost constantly on their phone? Well, that's the, well, you're, you're always <laughs> it's looking so at it. You're constantly yeah. online. It's your phone's always online it's and it's always in your pocket. It's fr and it's right. frequent, it's freakingly addictive. And, uh, and um, yeah, I mean, if I'm not on a computer, I'm on my phone and even if I have three seconds of dead time waiting in the grocery line at the store, my phone, that's out. Yep. It's depressing. <laughs> Ever try to ask directions on the street, you know, when you want, you want directions? Why would you Everybody ask directions? Either. You've got a smartphone. Because, well, but Google Maps is great when you're driving and not so great when you're walking because you're not walking fast enough for it to update in real time. That's why this so new augmented Google reality I. in Google yeah. Maps is well, so they're, no, great. They're, they're doing that. That's actually one of the things they That's want to do. That's why they're right? doing it. Yeah, yeah. Well, in the meantime, I occasionally want to ask directions, but everybody's on their phone, and, and you, they're inaccessible. <laughs> hey, they're in their hey, own little buddy, world. buddy, buddy, buddy. <laughs> exactly. Wow. Wow, yeah. wow, wow. What a world we live in. Uh, it's what can you say? But I, I mean, how many times you go to a restaurant and see a family sitting at a table and none of them are looking or talking to each other? They're all, even mom and dad, on their phone. Yeah, it's really depressing when that's our family. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I have to tell you, I'm a, I'm a, the canary in the coal mine. I'm an early adopter because I remember my kids berating me because I wouldn't put my Blackberry down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When my son was in college, he made us go on vacation to a, quote, resort in Mexico that had no cell phone service. He actually researched it and found one 
that was in a dead zone and that didn't mm. have an internet cafe. See, I think that's the thing. That's I think kids going. understand how deleterious yeah. this is. Exactly. He yeah. made me go through a week of detoxification. Oh, it was, I, it was no, I wouldn't accept that. No, nope. <laughs> well, you know, can't do it. I love, I love my okay. phone, but I love my kids even more. Oh, so. you must. <laughs> Yeah. And they love YouTube even more. <laughs> YouTube, Instagram, and Snapchat, number one. YouTube, 85% of teens say they use YouTube. 72% mm -hmm. use Instagram. That's really, that's a big jump, isn't it? Because uh, Snapchat used to be dominant. Instagram is just well, edging Snapchat. Well, but look Snapchat. at the right column, the one that they use the most. And that's where Snapchat is still dominant, still, 35%. Yeah, a lot of time spent. And look Snapchat. how low Instagram is on that one. It's only 15%, which yeah. is very interesting. Well, I think it's Instagram lend, lends itself to posting and moving on. Snapchat mm -hmm. is an interaction that you continue. Mm -hmm. But only 10% yes. use Facebook most often. And it's right. and it's only about yeah. half of the total usage. Instagram's more like a blog for teenagers. For my daughters, yes, Instagram's like I a blog. So. Yep. I was here. I did this. I, I posed yep. a picture Snapchat of me. Snapchat is an interactive thing. I mean, they're always. Snapchat is your messaging platform yeah. for you and your friends. Facebook is what you use to communicate with your grandparents. And that's why. It used and to be your parents. Now it's your grandparents, right? <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, exactly. I haven't met anybody in my daughter's. I've got two daughters at uh, 20 and, and 17, and none of them in that group use Facebook for anything other than a sort of a public face. They okay. use it occasionally. I have a theory. You tell me, though. The, that's because they don't, they haven't yet faced the problem that the rest of us face, which is they've moved on. Their friends are right there. They're too young to have friend groups in multiple places. But as they get older... And they have friends who were in high school, friends who were in college, friends who were at that job, but they no longer work with. That's when Facebook will become valuable to them. And I, I, if I were Facebook, I wouldn't necessarily be worried about this. I, for instance, my 26-year-old, who's been to two colleges, has lived in many countries. She does use Facebook. It's the only way she can keep track with a big... She couldn't do that on Instagram or on Snapchat? She uses Instagram, too. But the way you stay in touch and keep up on all this stuff... I left Facebook, and you know why I ended up going back? Because they had a tech TV reunion I didn't know about because the only way you could know about it was on Facebook. It's for, it's for diaspora communities. Mm, and yeah. I think that that's why kids don't need it yet. But that doesn't mean they're not going to turn to it no, once they... No, I'll challenge you there. My teenagers are getting really good at burning relationships. So burning bridges. <laughs> as you uh, so that's you why I don't need Facebook. I don't want to keep with... track of people. <laughs> exactly. So my Facebook is deleted. I think it's about uh, 10 days away from deactivation and good bloody riddance to it as well. And I, I, don't, I, I did not miss it when I was gone and I don't miss, I don't use it hardly anyway yet now, but uh, it was the only I, way I, I could I'm keep up with Facebook this because Every now and then I need a login for something and the only way I can do it is Facebook. But all I'll ever do is probably register and then delete it again. I, I my, my daughter's do use tools to stay in contact with people, but because they're always on, they're always constantly talking, they're always, you can't carry all of those people along behind you. They just become a dead weight on you emotionally. <laughs> I like, agree. You and I just, we just, like, I know nobody from my school, and I don't want to have anything to do with those morons. You know? Why okay, would you, okay, but would there you are people who like, like other people. people. You're a, you're a, you, you hate people, you're a misanthropist. Okay, I got it. <laughs> But, I mean, move on. Like, doesn't <laughs> life just keep moving on and you make new friends and you go through a new phase? Why are you dragging your say, high school along behind you like some ball Okay, and Larry, you're an old guy. Yeah, Don't you cherish those relationships yeah. you've had over these in these golden well, years? Well, the funny thing is that the only friends I have are old friends. Nobody <laughs> likes me anymore. But the old people still hug. But, you know, my kids are in their 30s and they are still in touch with their high school friends. And I don't yes. mean just that, like I am. Like, that's Facebook. Five years. Every, they know exactly. They yep. they go to parties and, the, you know, and they when they travel, they visit them. I think it's creepy, Facebook. but yeah, yeah. I don't think it's creepy. I think it's great. You know, if they like their friends, there, there are there are two kinds of people in the world. There are people who like people, and people who don't like people. There are people who like really cultivate and keep friendships, and they make a point of staying in touch and stuff. And I'm more like Greg. I don't want to. Uh, I actually am still friends with people I you know knew in college in my first couple of jobs, but I don't talk to them. Okay, very often. Seth, where do you come on this scale? Okay, so there's two things I use Facebook for. One is my mom thinks Facebook is the internet. She like she's like in one of those countries <laughs> yes, that yes. Facebook is the internet. Yes. Um, so 
if she wants to see pictures of, of is our that kids. Indiana? And what country? Whatever. Is, what country is that? Yeah, <laughs> Northeast Ohio. But yeah, yeah okay. so same thing. That's a country. <laughs> it's just to go over the much. border. Actually, I was pretty close. <laughs> yeah, actually, impressive. Uh, so <laughs> we put pictures on there for them that we absolutely and you know sometimes it's through Instagram or whatever. And then the other thing is like I do look at stats like you know whatever, but I I look at stats on Facebook through nine to five back and, and all the other stuff. So, uh, you know, as a publisher, I need to look at that stuff, at least know what's going on. Oh, yeah, so I use Facebook. To. Yes. There are so, some people, and I'm one of them that we, we, there's a professional reason we have to keep up with Facebook. I have to know what Facebook going on on Facebook so I can, right. I just show so Facebook, when, right? Yeah. I mean, del deleting Facebook for me, isn't sadly even an option. Like I wouldn't even yeah. consider it because of the business and my mom. Oh, mm -hmm. you're a good son, <laughs> Seth. You're a good yeah. son. Our show you're today. A boy chick. <laughs> you're a boy chick. <laughs> yeah. our, our show today brought to you by Rocket Mortgage. Talk about the old days. Remember, like, well, I remember when we bought our house four years ago, back back in the 2014s, 13s. Uh, you, if you wanted a home loan, you went to a bank because that's where the money is, right? In the the banker would have a sheaf of paper with all the rates on it. He, Our banker had a fancy mortgage amortization calculator. He was so proud of that. He'd put in numbers. He'd go, well, that's your payment right there. <laughs> He'd do it again. He just kept, he was so proud of that. And then, you know, you go through that indignity. Then he gives you an application, you know, 20 page. You got to take that home. You got to go to the attic and find your pay stubs from three years ago, bank statements from last century and get, get all that together and then send that packet in. And the irony of it was, and we went to the big bank, the bank everybody knows with this witch whips and the stagecoach and all that. And uh, they came back again and said, well, we need now, we now we need go back to the attic. We need this and this and this. And it took two months, two months. We were, they were asking us to fax stuff to them from our vacation. Finally got the loan, but man, we almost lost the house. That, that is the way it used to be. Fast forward to to 2018, baby. The modern times. Quicken Loans, the number one lender in the country, said this is not. This will not stand. We are going to make a way. You can you can get a loan entirely online. You can do it in a matter of minutes. You can do it from your phone. You could do it at an open house. It's called Rocket Mortgage. It's aptly named because it is fast. Rocket Mortgage is simple. It allows you to fully understand all the details, everything that's going on. They tell you. You can be confident you're getting that right loan. It's very easy. You don't have to go to the attic to get paperwork. Their trusted partners allow you to share your financial information at the touch of a button. It's very powerful. Rocket Mortgage can perform, get this, thousands of calculations in seconds. At best, that guy at the bank he could do one amortization in about 45 seconds at best. Based on income, assets, credit, Rocket Mortgage calculates the numbers. This is usually less than 10 minutes. They can analyze all the home loan options for which you qualify. Find the one that's right for you. You specify the term, the down payment, the rate. They say you're approved. You show it to the realtor. You make an offer. It's that fast. Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Really, this is the modern way to apply. Or, by the way, refi. Apply simply, understand fully, mortgage confidently at rocketmortgage.com slash twit2. That's rocketmortgage.com slash twit and the number two. Get that right. They are paying attention. Rocketmortgage.com slash twit2. It would help us if you would do that. Equal housing lender licensed in all 50 states and MLSconsumeraccess.org number 3030. And we thank Rocket Mortgage for making this week in tech possible. We had a very good week this week. In fact, it was such a good week we prepared a short informative documentary for you to watch. Enjoy. Previously on Twit. After going to Japan, this is another thing I'm just going to strongly suggest mm -hmm. on the handkerchief. Mm -hmm. iOS Today. One is for crying ladies. Okay. <laughs> we might need that. <laughs> then you keep the other one in your pocket. But that one, they came from the same pocket. <laughs> Okay, you see why well, you don't want it with crying ladies. You gotta be careful. Yeah. So, especially if you're the one that made them cry. <laughs> well, that's I guess maybe why I know a lot about crying ladies. This week in computer hardware. Did you see the uh, Atari VCS? I did. That went I up did. on Indiegogo yesterday. I, I I am ashamed to say that I actually really want one of these. <laughs> 
why are you ashamed outside well, of the fact that it's an Atari? It's an Atari. <laughs> I mean, it's absolutely a nostalgia play. Tech News Weekly. I thought we'd end this show by taking a look at what I what I got from Amazon. For Thank the audio you. listeners, I will just say this is a pretty large box, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> there. And at the bottom of the box, <laughs> <laughs> it's a package of Oreo cookies. That is really the worst thing to happen to anyone. Twit. Hashtag <laughs> Pat's Check. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think maybe this flavor might be the worst thing to happen to anyone. I'm going to try it. Obviously, we have to wait until Tuesday. Yes. Unless Burke has his hand, that he, his mechanical hand that steals his the Oreos. <laughs> 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 you want to tweet at me, I'm at Megan Maroney. Yeah, I'm at Jason Hell. I'm, I'm not doing that. Megan's doing that to I've herself. I've never I seen that hand. Jason, stop. <laughs> 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 I want one of them. <laughs> that is awesome. I didn't know... We even had those. Also, that Atari VCS is is weird. Who would pay three hundred dollars to play video games like we played in nineteen seventy eight? Yeah, I got the original twenty six hundred recently. You, you know, the did you 30, have one? Thirty dollar. Well, it's just like the thirty dollar. Oh, the thirty dollar one. Get. It's got all the games in it. Yeah. Yeah, and I played combat, and I remember playing combat and yep. having a good time and spending days playing it and i couldn't play it for 10 seconds it's terrible it was the slowest worst <laughs> thing ever it's so terrible but i have to say i got that for our 15 year old for christmas it was the number one christmas gift i noticed he doesn't play it anymore but at the time he was very <laughs> very excited about it so apparently that would, there's, me, that would be cool of me getting a black and white tv with rabbit ears as a way of it's so know, going weird. back to my childhood so people are paying uh hey get 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 you want to get <laughs> the hand is really creepy. That is weird. I just want to say that is really a creepy hand because it's very, uh, it's like a little baby hand. It's, I don't know, for people listening at home, you're, you're really missing nothing. <laughs> it's just a creepy little baby hand on a stick. So, uh, yeah, stop it. $299. Uh, for this uh, collector's edition, and if you want the joystick, twenty nine dollars. That's crazy. yeah, but you know, if you live in San Francisco, you probably spend that on a good night out on the booze. Uh, Easily, yeah, two hundred bucks doesn't, yeah. doesn't get what it used to, did it? Does it? Yeah, if you're a Silicon Valley type person and you're taking down two hundred fifty thousand a year for a scut work day job, like you get in in Silicon Valley, then you know, three hundred yep. bucks yep. is a no uh, sanity deal. check. Nothing, no big deal. Nothing. Yeah, chicken feed. Did you That's see? Gonna buy it. Did you see the <laughs> protesters in San Francisco? So there's several things to protest these days yes. in San Francisco. <laughs> One, of course, <laughs> is the fact that housing prices are through Crazy. the roof. Nobody can afford to live there anymore because uh -huh. they say because of the tech bros and all the companies and and the housing crisis. And so there's people upset about that. And then there's these scooters. <laughs> Oh, God. Bird. <laughs> Death traps. <laughs> everywhere. So, so they're everywhere. I, it's, yeah. I first saw them in uh, Santa Monica. And it is bad because um, yeah. they people ride the scooter. It's three bucks to ride it. You use your phone to activate it. You go, zzz, you get to where you're going, and then you just hop off, and then you leave the scooter. And there's scooters everywhere. So in San Francisco, protesters decided to combine the two. <laughs> And they uh, piled a bunch of scooters up in front of a, the Google bus or one of the one of the buses. Did you know that there were over fifty? And set them on fire. Oh no! And uh, no, actually, that's a fake fire. They didn't. They didn't actually destroy anything. But that's very San Francisco. It just flares. Yeah. It just flares. But it's it's very very San Francisco. <laughs> have, have you ever ridden one of those scooters? They look deadly. I actually own a couple of them. Yeah. Uh, okay. They are deadly. For people our age, bad yeah. idea. But if you're a kid, you're used to it. The key is, the problem is they have these electric motors that are super high torque. Right. They're right? fast, yeah. Yeah, they're not just fast. You press the button, they go, whoa! Right. Right. It's like a buck and bronco. So yeah. you really <laughs> have to learn that you get the scooter going with your foot, like a real scooter, and then you very carefully, gently depress the trigger. Otherwise, but it's a rental. Who knows how? How do you know that when you put your three dollars down? Well, that's you right. Been on before, well, right? you won't. The learning curve is steep. If you, <laughs> you, if learn, you, survive, you learn yeah. quickly. There's also, as long as we're talking scooters, a whole new business. 
Turns out these scooter companies will pay people 15, as much as 15 bucks to charge the scooter. That's a problem they have, right? No, mm. Nobody's, they're just riding them. Nobody's charging them. So high school kids have gone around gathering scooters and bringing them to somewhere they can plug them in for, for pocket money. Actually, pretty good money. You could buy one of those Atari VCSs for that. <laughs> a good day's work will get you an Atari. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. <laughs> it's a it's a weird model like for sure like it's it's crazy but like the idea that you know you, you could just pick up a scooter outside of whatever building you're at it's awesome and go and go to another building there is some oh it's like it's awesome it, i don't know i right. i have a feeling there's gonna be a problem so i was in seattle recently and they've got these bikes or similar thing with bikes i found bikes everywhere i mean in residential neighborhoods oh you can't I, oh it's not like the know. city bikes where you have to dock it in the bike no they're dockless bikes and the oh. problem is people leave them they take them home to the suburbs where they live <laughs> where nobody is going to want to rent it and so they're just sitting around in these odd random places and i i saw one near my hotel and it was there for the whole time I was in Seattle, three days, that bike was still in, in the same exact spot because where I was staying, I guess nobody wanted to rent a bike. So I, no, I, I don't in know fact, if this is gonna work. I think this, this probably started with Google, right? Because well, the uh, uh, the Google has well, bikes in front of every yeah, building. They're you, for employees, yeah. They're for, but they yeah. lose, according to uh, uh, Bicycling Magazine, more than a thousand Hundreds, more than a hundred bikes every week disappear. Wow! Yeah, and, permanently. People and, just throw them in rivers. The the challenge has been that they throw them in the river, and that's or the other problem. And stuff yeah, you see and them then all over the place. We don't have rivers in Silicon Valley. We and then no, there's a if, creek if full a, of Google bikes. I have a picture. Creeks, yeah. <laughs> and if you have an event like a concert or something, people just ride up on it and then just start throwing them on top of the other bikes, and then you actually find um, emergency exits all blocked up with bikes piled up, and the they ha what do you do when, when you've got 5,000 bikes piled up outside of a concert you know, hall? In the 60s, there was a group called the Provos in Amsterdam. I think it was an anarchist collective. And they actually bought these bikes and put them all over Amsterdam with this great I, sort of social. Amsterdam system, is very you know. bike friendly. They, yeah, but it didn't last because these bikes basically were stolen. But it was a great idealistic concept for a while. Yeah. I was. The, well, the, the is, remedy, is, though, like the remedy to this is that you build infrastructure and you put you know, bike parking Some lots building. outside yeah. of every building. Yeah, and I agree. Like, frankly, it's not such a crazy idea. I think I very much enjoy right, yeah. getting around cities on bikes. Or electric, electric scooters. Bikes. I mean, it really, yeah. it, it beats the traffic. The problem is people ride them on the sidewalk. Um, they, they ride them irresponsibly. And then this, you know, uh, the scooter companies say, well, it's, you know, it's not our fault. Uh, people are not obeying the law. They're not wearing their helmets or they're not, but yeah, there is some responsibility that goes. Well, on. the problem is that when you rent a bike, it's hard to have. They don't rent. They don't include helmets right. with the bike. So right. that's a that that's a tough one. In fact, New York City had a law that you had to rent a helmet, but the New York was actually sanctioning bikes. They, they you know one of these bike things in New York where you can't get a helmet. So they had to modify the law, as I understand it, so people who rented the bikes could legally ride them without helmets. That's that's one way to solve it. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I, can, I have they a up just bike becoming I, litter though. Like, travel with. Well, that's what I. That's what these bird scooters in Santa Monica. They just were strewn everywhere. And San Francisco might even be worse because uh, there's several. There's like two. Bird will be there, but other companies and Lyft has just gotten approval to do. Yeah, the bikes San Francisco uh, government of San Francisco. I don't know what it's called. A council, city council, supervisors, or something? Council, the yeah. board yeah, of supervisors. They've just announced that uh, they're only going to license four scooter companies, oh. and they're going to put a whole bunch of conditions on them. So, a couple of scooter companies have just gone out of business because they didn't make the cut. Oh, that's true. And um, yeah. On the other uh, hand, I have to I mean, say, driving in San Francisco, downtown San Francisco, is a nightmare. The city yeah. is not friendly to cars. They uh, they'll tow you. The tickets are huge. There's very little mm -hmm. parking. It's not designed to be friendly for cars. And I think really this is a first step maybe towards making urban areas a car-free zone, which I don't think yeah. would be a bad thing at all. Yeah, I'm trying to think of uh, – there's an email that I get every week. Uh, it's a French analyst, and he's predicting that this idea of micro-mobility is going to be the next biggest wave. And, the, and what he's trying to point out like is, is that – you know, 80% of all journeys are like one to five kilometers long. Right. So right. why are you owning a car? You don't really want a self-driving car. You just no. want something that's better than walking or whatever. So um, this idea of hiring a scooter or a bicycle does matter, especially in Europe, where a lot of the streets are, you know, driving a car is pointless most of the time. Like London, for example, you spend more time getting down to the tube than you spend on the tube. Yeah. 
you know, be a lot easier on a good day to just ride an electric scooter need, from you point need, to point. You need to be pretty uh, careful about making sure cyclists stay off the sidewalk. In Japan, I was in Japan a, mm -hmm. couple, a couple of weeks ago, and people ride bikes on the sidewalk everywhere, and they ride it at full speed. It's kind of terrifying. Nobody seems to get hit. Everybody seems to coexist, but it's kind of scary. You know, the irony is that the biggest sponsor of the bikes in San Francisco is Ford, which is calling itself a mobility company. And they actually see this as part of their strategy on how they're going to survive with the current, you know, young generation, the people who are not buying two cars per family like my generation did. So bikes are sort of the last mile in Ford's strategy, I think. We, I'm only a couple of miles from work, and I would Segway or bicycle or scooter uh, to work, except that there's no good way to go. Did you say Segway? I, we happen to own a Segway or two, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> that, that's where they went. Why? I, why. <laughs> I love my Segways. Okay, I admit I look like an idiot on it, especially with my pink shorts, but... Uh, <laughs> As you can see, oh, I have oh, no pride. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I know. I know. Um, what was I saying? Oh, but it, the infrastructure doesn't support it. It's the only ways to go is through heavily trafficked corridors. That I just don't feel safe riding. Right. So that's part of. I think you're right, Seth. I think if 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 cities want to make it welcoming to these things, that would be a, a, a on balance a good thing. I think, but they have to do that instead of just saying, uh, "You can't." You know, you guys, you kids, get off of my lawn with your scooters. The other thing is they can make scooters a lot lighter. If they can make them a little bit lighter, I, I guess, then they can become personal and you can, you know, carry your, yeah. you know, your backpack around with it. Our son, this is, I'm so proud of him. Uh, he goes to school pretty far away, like 20 miles away, his high school. He um, takes the smart train. There's a light rail from Petaluma to San Rafael. He carries a folded up electric scooter with him. Great. He gets off the smart train and scooters to school, a mile and a half to school, scooters back to the train, rides the train home. That's great. Isn't that awesome? That's and that's not even an urban area. We're in rural Cal Northern California. Yeah. Oh, that's the future. That's I love it. Yeah. I have a fold-up yeah. bike, which I it's not quite small enough to take on an airplane, but I can keep it in the back of my car. And when I go into San Francisco, I often just park anywhere. And that's just, a great idea. Know, take the bike yeah. out of the back of the car. Yeah. yeah. There was a service in San Francisco. I bet they're out of business right now. Uh, you'd press a button. It was a valet car service. You'd, op you'd, you'd just say where you wanted to be. The guy would ride a, a scooter up to you. All right. Get park in the car, car, park it, and then he'd bring it to you when you were done. So you didn't have makes, to worry. Makes beautiful sense. That's a great idea. In a sense, that's what, what driverless cars are all about, right? The idea of the yeah. autonomous vehicle is going to pick you up, drop you off, and, and go find a place to park if you own it. Or it'll go take someone else for a ride if it's... Yes. Uh, a fleet car. That's a future I look forward to. I think that's a that's, or maybe even if you do own it, maybe you could make some money. You know, even if you own the car, why can't you get paid to have it drive somebody else around while you're you know in your meeting or at work? I uh, let's, let's take a, let's take a little time out. We'll come back with more. We've got a great panel. Larry Maggot is here. CBS News Radio. Always a thrill. How's your back? Feeling all right? It's all right. I love your breaks because they gave me a chance yeah. to stretch. Take a take a walk. Take a you hike. You make money. I get I get my back relief. It's it a it's a beautiful thing. It's a win win. Seth Weintraub's here. He is uh, of course the founder and publisher of Nine to Five Mac, Nine to Five Google, um, and Electric dot com. This is an electric car publication. I think your heart's in that one for some reason. I feel like that, Seth. That's it, it's the latest of my baby. So yeah. it's yeah, and and the new one. Which is uh, drone DJ drone DJ dot com, right? It's not just DJI's though; it's all drones. It's all drones, but you know, you kind of think about DJI because they, the they're king. eighty percent of the market. They're the king of the hill. Are they that big, that dominant? Wow. Yeah, the consumer space. I miss my Mavic Pro. I hope it's enjoying its retreat in the Caribbean. <laughs> <laughs> extended holiday extended part. holiday greg farrow also yeah. here from the packet pushers network it's getting late i know so we're, we're gonna we're gonna hurry and get you home oh don't do that we're having so much fun <laughs> i want to tell you what i cooked for dinner the other night we've been having so much fun you know we're big blue apron uh, users we usually do two or three blue apron menus uh, a week and uh oh i made what did i make? oh there's a barbecue wings recipe that is so so good it's just mouth-wateringly good and then what did I make the other day? It's just so much fun. Blue Apron is the number one fresh ingredient recipe delivery service in the country. 
Uh, they, you don't have to worry about meal planning. You get straight to cooking with Blue Apron. You know, at the end of the day, you don't really want to plan, shop, and cook. But what if you went home and all the, it's like you had a sous chef. All the ingredients you needed were there, beautiful too, just perfect, all ready to go. All you have to do is get out the pan and cook them. By the way, they're very sensitive about they. They very often reuse pans. What was it we cooked the other day that was so good, Lisa? Oh, the Kung Pao chicken was amazing. It even had a little uh, Kung Pao pepper, the really hot Chinese peppers in there. Oh, it was so good. And so that's a perfect example. You know, I if that if I bought a box of Chinese peppers, I would use it once and then I would have a box in my fridge for the rest of my life. But it comes with one. It's perfect. Just you need a little tea, teaspoon of soy sauce. That's what you get. You get exactly the ingredients you need to make the recipe. And it's fun, too. I made that, that one with the, the ramen bowl. I made that. Michael liked that. He didn't eat the hard-boiled egg, but I did. I loved that. That was really good. Oh, no, he did eat the hard-boiled egg. Yeah. That was, oh, it's awesome. It's great when you have kids. They learn to cook. They participate. They get excited about the food. It's a really great skill for them. It's great for me. I like to cook. But I, I, I often cook the same thing over and over because I can't think of something new. So Blue Apron gives me new horizons. We've been doing the Airbnb menu for a while. They were doing menus uh, from Airbnbs all over the world we were doing. We did one from, I think the Kung Pao Chicken was from Shanghai. It was really, really good. Um, Mediterranean food like seared salmon and spicy orange salsa. Uh, centered around fruits, veggies, lean meats, plenty of olive oil. You'll love the Mediterranean menu. They're nutritious but delicious. Chef-designed recipes. My mouth waters every time I do these ads. I go crazy. Blue Apron delivered fresh, delivers fresh pre-proportioned ingredients, step-by-step -step recipes right to you. You choose what you want. They have 12 new recipes every week. You can choose two, three, or four recipes based on what best fits your schedule. If you're not going to be home, you can, you can delay it. You don't have to get it every week. You can count on non-GMO ingredients, meat with no added hormones. The Blue Apron menu changes every week. They won't repeat more than once a year. Do you see the Chrissy Teigen stuff? Look at that. Chrissy Teigen's sweet and spicy chicken lettuce cups. Look at that. They've teamed up with Chrissy Teigen, best-selling cookbook author, to bring you some of her favorite recipes to make at home. Get ready for six weeks. I love it that Blue Apron does things like this. These events are so much fun, of wildly fun, flavorful cooking, featuring recipes like garlic and soy-glazed shrimp with charred broccoli and hot greens pepper sauce. By the way, that's a new thing I've been doing you do something like that. So we, it, we instead of uh, steaming the broccoli, we put it in the toaster oven and, and charred it. It was so good. That's how we make broccoli now. We learned it from Blue Apron. Sesame chicken noodles with bok choy. Blue Apron. I love it. Check out this week's menu. Get your first meals, first three meals free with free shipping at blueapron.com slash twit. That's pretty good. Three meals free with free, free shipping. Blueapron.com slash twit. Blue Apron is a better way to cook and I hope I didn't make you all hungry starving yeah me too <laughs> <laughs> new emojis are here the new emojis are here are you ready are you excited here's from the uh, the emoji committee of uh, oh actually it's Jeremy who's on the emoji committee he's at emojipedia the brand new emojis pleading face woozy face smiling with three hearts hot and cold face uh, those are red-haired people. <laughs> Apparently, they haven't had those in the past. Curly-haired people. All the cur all the curly-haired people are happy. And finally, for people like me, white-haired people. Plus bald. <laughs> Gotta have bald people. No hair at all. Uh, super villain, male or female. Superhero, also male or female. Uh, uh, kind of strangely, weirdly disembodied body parts, like a leg and a foot. But if you think that's weird, there's also a tooth and a bone. Ew. <laughs> Goggles and a lab coat if you're into science, like uh, Ivanka Trump. Hiking boots, women's flat shoes. There's a microbe. Mosquito, parrot, badger. That's not a skunk. That's a badger. Peacock, raccoon. Again, not a skunk. Swan, kangaroo, and lobster. The, the skunk law. Oh, I got to point out, though, we mentioned this when they first proposed it. That is not a uncooked lobster. Lobsters are not red. That is a cooked lobster. Mm. You think that's going to be controversial? 
<laughs> it has to be. It has to, it has to be. <laughs> Everything's controversial. A strangely uh, prancing hippopotamus. Now, these are the proposed... These are kind of the... Um, these are not necessarily what you'll get from Facebook or Google or Twitter or Apple. They do their own. They'll 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 have a hippopotamus, but it won't necessarily be the prancing, fancy pants hippopotamus that the uh, f the folks at Unicode have proposed. There's a llama. Climate change. They have their own emoji. Who? People who deny climate change. Do they, do yeah. they get their own emoji? Yeah. It's called moon cake. Okay. <laughs> Compass, luggage, bricks, and skateboard. <laughs> There's something for everybody. Flying disc, not a Frisbee note. That would be a trademark violation. A pawn, a softball, a jigsaw, toolbox magnet. magnet. It's really, yeah, you're bored. Aren't you? Yeah. You don't, that's because you're old. Young people, emojis are so very important to them. That's and how they, they communicate. Say, it's like hieroglyphics. Yeah. 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 Uh, that's great. Keep up the good work. <laughs> Well, isn't isn't the the Chinese alphabet sort of just a whole series of emojis? In I guess a way? it is, isn't it? It's, you know, yeah. It's higher, it's, so they uh, got it right. Yeah, it works for them. Pic pictograms, yeah. they call it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know about this uh, picture that the AP has put out. I don't know who these people are, but uh, mm. the story is a hacker gets five years for Russian-linked Yahoo security breach. Um, Karim Baratov was fined a quarter of a million dollars. I think that's the judge. I don't know. I, no, it says U.S. judge, and that's clearly not a U.S. judge. Uh, I don't, This picture doesn't seem to make any sense. No. <laughs> I couldn't make any sense of it either, for what it's worth. Who are these people? Yeah. It's not yeah. Kareem. He's a young guy. Uh, he's 23. Yeah. I don't see him in the picture. Maybe he's the... Maybe she looks, maybe he... She looks maybe, a little like Roseanne Barr, but I don't yeah, think... Yeah, maybe is. that... I don't know what's going on in this picture. Um, <laughs> Unless but it's the, the person in the middle at the back. It's, could you think that this whole picture really... Yeah. That, that this guy is, is, the, is the perp? And the yeah. rest of it, they couldn't get a clear shot. That's that's the parents and the lawyer. Mom and dad and and, and, and the barrister, because it was in the, it was yeah. in Canada, right? Um, yeah. In which case, they didn't do a very good job with the iPhone of taking a photo. I know. <laughs> so, uh, Baratov uh, was uh, worked with Russia. His name is Russian, but he's not. He's Canadian. He was born in Russia, but he he was charged with using data passed to him by Russia's Federal Security Service to hack email accounts of journalists, business leaders, and others. It turns out Baratov was running a <laughs> international hacker-for-hire business. Mm -hmm. uh, he would he put out a shingle, well, a website in this case, in which uh, a website named WebHacker, and he advertised in Russian, and advertised for the hacking of email accounts without prepayment, which is, I think, good marketing. Um, oh, this is a file photo company on the internet today and that's his parents <laughs> yeah okay that's a file and that's his uh, lawyer okay in uh, hamilton okay mm. there you go that's from a year ago though so that's that's as yeah. close as they get all right it's a good business though he collected 1.1 million in his fees which he, he was, used to buy a house and expensive he was driving cars. fancy cars he was driving a house yep. Mm, yep. Uh, but the thing is he was a dupe basically of the russian security service he um, wasn't a dupe he was getting paid well, he was one of the <laughs> cash well, dupe. yeah yeah, but he didn't know what he was doing. Where he can he we find? We need was. we need a young Canadian to hack email addresses. He's oh, going to yes. be like some Silicon Valley CEO, and he's going to go like, "You're giving me money because I am the smartest security hacker on the planet. That's yeah. why you're going." Obviously, was, I am successful because I'm the best. You he know, he's pretty good. So he yep. orchestrated uh, the the one of the Yahoo breaches. I didn't realize there were multiple ones. The to overall Yahoo uh, loss was three billion accounts. Right. He's only yep. responsible for the first half billion. No. Oh. <laughs> in uh, 2014, uh, he uh, was named uh, in the indictment that charged two Russian spies with orchestrating the Yahoo breach. And apparently Baratov used hmm. that stolen data to hack then journalists, business leaders, and others. So a uh, Russian influence. So actually, I guess what that means is that Yahoo breach was all about the Russian security services getting the credentials for a few people that they wanted to target. And the rest of us, we were just collateral yep. damage. Yep. That's wow. That sounds about right. Yeah. But he apologized and promised to be a better man and obey the law on his release. 
In five years, he's going to Silicon Valley, baby. He's got a job right. waiting for him. He's going to be Seven because, and they're going to love him because he's been a he's you know been a successful CC, CEO yep. but failed. Yep. Remember, failure is important Failure's in Silicon good. Valley. Nothing Don't, wrong with failure. Have, you can't you can't have somebody in charge of a startup if you haven't failed at least twice. Oh, good. And, I qualify. Uh, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> that may be the only qualification I have. But Pretty much my yeah. life story. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Let's see. Uh, what else? What else? Um, uh, Microsoft, this was, I don't know if this has any merit or value, but it's kind of an interesting factoid. Microsoft surpassed Alphabet's market cap this, wow. this week. Uh, th there, there is a race going on to become the first company to reach a trillion dollars in market cap. Apple's pretty close. I think they're close to 900 million. Mm -hmm. Uh, Alphabet's in there uh, too. Google's in there. Did they say where Microsoft is getting the bulk of that money? Because I mean, it's 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 different than it was back in the old days when it was all about packaged software. Yeah, you know, so much of that is cloud based today. But I don't know if they broke it down. Uh, I don't know. It's mostly, it's future value. It's not past value. Uh, what the market is very pleased to see is the cloud business, the Azure business, yes. Yes. Uh, is really accelerating away. Uh, Microsoft is now... But if you're excited about Microsoft's cloud business, why would you value them higher than Alphabet? Uh, because it doesn't work Azure's that way. Got a much, you, well, because Microsoft's Azure business is going to be worth a lot more money. So Google's working in the consumer market, putting ads mm -hmm. in front of eyeballs. Right. But that market has reached its maximum size. There's not more eyeballs to reach, whereas Microsoft through Azure and like have as we've seen with Amazon's AWS, they're just starting to get open up the market in cloud computing. So the potential for future revenue growth um, and the ability of and Microsoft's demonstrating the ability to transition people away from their legacy infrastructure and suck them into the Azure and trap them in the cloud so that all the future revenues get uh, fairly firmly uh, forwarded to Microsoft shareholders. Um, well, and what we're seeing is that Microsoft's investments, so Microsoft's now outspending Google on R&D and CapEx in terms of building out its cloud because it's already got the revenue on the board. You can, you know, what's interesting is that the prices were pretty much in sync going up through February of this year. And then Google, actually, let's make it late March, Google pretty much flattened out while Microsoft continued to go up. So I don't know what yep. the news was at that point, but uh, well, I remember when they had their their big developers conference just about a month or two ago, and the big news out of that was that Windows was hardly even on the agenda. I mean, it was it was yeah, the market was liked cloud. that. The market, yeah, the market liked, liked it. it. Yeah, and I was up there last yeah. week and met with people, and again, it, it, it's all cloud. I mean, it's 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 Azure yep. and other, uh, and and to the extent that they are a software company, it's software by subscription as opposed to actually purchasing your software. So, you know, like mm. a lot of other people, I write my $100 a year check to Microsoft. It's kind of painless. But over the long run, that's going to add up to a lot of money now, a lot, with a lot of me. Tell me this, Larry. You don't actually write a check, I hope. No, I don't write okay. a check. But I do, I do, <laughs> I do, I do pay, for, pay $100 a year. It comes out of a credit card. I don't care yeah. when I've written. I don't even know where my when check I, I know. When did I last write a check? Is that, is that funny? I mean, we used to write checks all the time, and yeah. nobody writes checks anymore. My wife has a checkbook. I, I almost never use it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, in in a, in a couple of generations, we'll still be saying writing checks, and sure. and the kids will go, what, what what's what's a check? Well, people talk about filming. You know, right. people say, oh, I filmed this movie. When's Nobody, the last what, time you filmed? dialed a phone? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I, I believe most of what it is is that Microsoft is in the cloud. They're showing good growth. They're investing heavily, so they're spending twelve percent of their revenue as CapEx to grow it out. And uh, they are very strong globally. So where AWS is particularly strong it's, in the US. It's a very US centric business, it, isn't it? Yeah. They're growing and they're growing very fast. They're spending heavily. So, you know, I don't want to understate what they're doing, but Microsoft has very strong business in Asia and uh, Africa, Africa and Europe. Yeah. They have more data centers uh, are up and running now. They're not as big as AWS. AWS has tended to build uh, less numbers of data centers, but make them phenomenally larger. 
Um, and of course, they're running into power problems. So they're not able to get enough power to keep that model going. So Microsoft's decision to have smaller and more data centers is generally oh, worked that's out interesting. Oh, better. Yeah, that's a good insight. They have, so everybody's struggling to get power because when you want to get like, you know, 10 megawatts, 50 megawatts, 100 megawatts, um, and you want to put like 250,000 computers in four data halls, you know, you, you're trying to sign a 20-year agreement to get power. That's the whole output of a power station. In or a the Bitcoin country. miner. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Wow. Well, I think the Bitcoin mining thing is just one of those industries that's a flash in a pan until uh, we see the next generation of ASICs. There'll be some respins. We'll see an FPGA or an ASIC or a dedicated. Today we're using general purpose GPUs to do crypto mining. It would make more sense to have custom ASICs for those, and it'll be a few more years before they come around, and then we'll see the power curve drop right off. Although apparently Bitcoin mining uses as much power now as Ireland. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I, I do feel that eventually the you know there'll be the companies out there designing ASICs. Remember, Apple bought PA Semi to do the ARM chip and then to right. redesign it. it took five years for that right. to come along. Bitcoin's right. really. You think there'll be custom ASICs just for Bitcoin? Yeah, well, there's already a lot of crypto ASICs out there today. Could you? But I do would it, would it, is there such a thing as a generic blockchain ASIC? I think there will be in the same way that we're seeing Google do Tensor, the TPU, Tensor are, Processing are the, Unit for are AI. Are the computations involved in all cryptocurrency roughly the same? What is it, prime number factoring? Is that what they're doing? Yeah, it's all crypto. So there's plenty of crypto chips out there, but my, yeah. I'm, not a, I'm not a blockchain expert. But it does make sense that when there's a market big enough and yeah, uh, when, it's, chips, when it becomes, when it becomes yeah. static, like at the moment, there's too much iteration around the crypto algorithms and the, the software. But at some point, that, that market will reach a you know, a plateau, and that'll be the point when we see custom ASICs just for Bitcoin mining come out. I would imagine that, that there are companies out there designing them, you know, Caviam, Broadcom, the usual criminals. I'm just looking if I can find a cryptocurrency ASIC. I mean, there are specific ASIC miners designed for cryptocurrency, but they're not probably tuned to blockchain yeah. particularly. Well, the GPU does the functionality quite well. But, you know, Cavium, for example, has been producing a crypto chip uh, that we've been using in network appliances for the last 15 years. And that has just been used for the TLS and the HTTPS and the IPSEC. And that chip has been widely used. That must not be easily adapted for use in these, or maybe it's not fast enough. Or, But they've been using GPUs. Now, GPU is a general purpose graphics processor. It's like what Intel is on the x86. It's a general purpose uh, piece of silicon. But... At some point, when the market gets big enough, it makes sense to make a custom ASIC that does just the things that That's you need. That's actually, though, not necessarily. That may be a, a, a not a benign influence on the problem of Bitcoin mining because it just continues to concentrate the mining mm. into a small group of people, right? Because these are very yeah. expensive, presumably going to be very expensive chips. That, um, yeah. Well, you know, this is what I mean. The, 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 there has to be a plateau. There has to be enough demand. Right. There has to be enough people who want them, you know, that sort of stuff. And that, that plateau hasn't been reached. And it's not actually yet actually guaranteed that cryptocurrencies or crypto, you know, the blockchain is actually going to be a thing. What? Right. right. Like, it's not a thing? I thought it was a well, thing. Not a, not a thing for me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, there's a lot of momentum. I mean, we've seen these sorts of fads come and go. Yeah. And there's no question that Bitcoin, you know, is right on the edge of the chasm, you know, crossing the chasm sort of a thing. But until the governments come around and start to say these are currencies and they have to be regulated and that's, a, that's the next step. And until we see that sort of acceptance by... Um, you know, the incumbent financial institutions that this is a viable form of value exchange. We're not going to, I don't see how these cryptocurrencies will survive. Well, certainly there'll be a massive shakeout. Sh uh, only a few of these crypto well, coins will survive. If they become legitimate, what's the point? Well, that's the question. Like ultimately, yeah. even the Bitcoin network today runs so slow and is so expensive that it's not a threat to Visa. Visa can right. process a transaction for three cents per transaction and charge is third, basically, I think it's like 15 cents. And so it actually makes out pretty well. But a Bitcoin transaction costs about $15 in electricity to run through and takes hmm. roughly four days, three days, I think. Last time I yeah. checked, I've stopped bothering because I'm just tired of getting blockchain pitches. But And so the problem with the blockchain is if you have a transaction today and you exchange coins, you need to wait three days before the, the network's complete, before the transaction completes. And it's so volatile, you don't know what you paid. 
three, yeah. for three days. For them, you, if you have to wait three days, why don't you just mail a check? Yeah, right. <laughs> oh, <laughs> the checks, they're back, coming back. Order, right? They're coming back, coming back. And you know, it may very well. Books are coming back. Vinyl is coming back. Vinyl is I huge. I think I'm going to invest in a check printing company. That's I my next All the hipster business. kids will be writing checks yeah. That's with right. quill pens. Exactly. It'll be so exciting. We're going to take on a little, little break. Get, yep. get to the last, the bottom of the... At the end of this show, all the all the good stuff sinks to the bottom. Or maybe it's just the seeds and the stems. We're going to get to that in just a second. But first, a word from Moogsoft. You probably know about Moogsoft, Greg Farrow. It is a, oh, a little bit about yeah. them. Yes, indeed. A yeah. Algorithmic IT Ops. Uh, that's the AI in Moogsoft AI. It is a brilliant solution for people who are on pager duty, you know, that you're, you're the one who gets the incident reports. You're the one who gets all the notifications. And it's kind of like a pachinko machine in your head. It's just bing, 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 bing. And at some point when all those alerts and tickets are lighting up your monitor like a Christmas tree, you're just not, you're so stressed out. You're not being productive. You, nobody can analyze those alerts and respond intelligently to all those tickets. But that's where Moogsoft AI Ops comes in. It reduces the IT alerts and tickets by up to 99%, not by turning them off, but by consolidating them, correlating events into actionable work items. They call them situations. So you can say, I need to handle this. You handle the stuff that matters. It's brilliant. It works with all your IT tools. So all of those, all of those pingers can all be at work, but Moogsoft's AI ops platform correlates them and makes it easy for you to respond to. Here's a customer testimonial, actually, from... A company called HCL Technologies, they are a global IT managed service provider. That means they, they live in the pachinko parlor. They, they, got multiple, <laughs> they got multiple clients, multiple alerts coming from every possible t bit of telemetry. They actually created a, something called the Dry Ice Platform, and they use Moogsoft AI Ops as their event management layer. People love Dry Ice. It's award-winning. And it, it's helped their clients streamline operational workflows, reduce time in the detect to correct life cycle of incident tickets. Actually, by a lot, 33% reduction in the mean time to restore. Just because of that means they can support more customers with service quality, keeping operational costs low, efficiency high. It's been really great for HCL Technologies. It could be great for you, too. With Moogsoft AI Ops, you can reduce your IT alerts and tickets by up to 99% right now. Wouldn't that be nice? Visit Moogsoft.com to get a demo. Moogsoft, you see the logo? It's got a cow. That's the moo. I don't know what the G is. And then they're soft. <laughs> Actually, I got the story from the founder. He's a big cow fan. He wanted to call it Moogsoft. He couldn't get the domain. He's also a fan of the Moog synthesizer. So he said, yep. oh, we just had a G. We'll call it Moogsoft. Well, that's Moogsoft.com. M-O-O-G-S-O-F-T.com. And get a demo. We thank Moogsoft so much for their support of this week in tech. What actually, mm -hmm. I've been meaning to ask you since we've got you got you on, Seth. Uh, there have been just now. I, I have to say, there have been in the time since the last Tesla accident, there have been probably thirty thousand accidents with thousands of deaths with gas, normal gas vehicles. But because these are self-driving cars or autopilot or whatever, you get a lot of attention. Seems like there's been a lot of accidents lately. Um, Uber decided to, to stop working on this self-driving uh, technology entirely, I think. Is that right? Um, what's the no, what's, yeah, what's no going on? Uh, I think you're just going to, like with any new te technology, you're going to see a lot of fits and start, stops and starts. Um, you know, like we get, so uh, I think we're one of the bigger uh, EV sites and autonomous sites. So we get um, probably one or two tips a day from some you know, small local paper that a Tesla was in an accident. Right. And there's oh, really no news. Yeah, there's no, no news. news there. Yeah. Right. So, you know, when it's driving autonomously and a lot of people say they're driving an autopilot and aren't. So sometimes you have to wait for Tesla to verify. Then it becomes kind of news if, if you know, somebody's been driving an autopilot and they hit that, um, you know, that center divider thing and, and dies, it was sadly. Um, that becomes, you know, a story, I guess. Um, but I kind of feel like this is how it's going to happen. Like, like these things aren't just going to automatically one day be perfect. Um, and I think that's kind of the narrative that's happening in the media right now. It's like a, a few people are, are saying that, you know, people are going to die. Sat, you know, this is not happy, but 
people are going to die as this technology matures. But I think this, the long term, uh, you know, end result is going to be that more people will will live because a lot of these accidents will be avoided. And but I think the takeaway right now is that don't take your eyes off the road, like yes. in any yes. car. You and mentioned that, the Cadillac uh, C right. CT6. Uh, I drove six. that. I drove that also. That's actually mm -hmm. a really smart, much smarter, I think, than Tesla's. It has a camera that's looking at your eyes, mm -hmm. and if you look away, it says, "Wait a minute!" You know, for five seconds, it vibrates the seat vigorously. Yeah. It's it, violent. Yeah. I don't. I don't know if you tried it because it was very hard for me to look away for the road for any length of time. Yeah. I finally I put did. my hands over my eyes and peeked. And it thought I wasn't looking because I couldn't. I want. I'm, we're driving at highway speeds. I can't, and I don't trust these right. things. But I think I think GM actually has done it pretty well. I think that Cadillac system is good. So, yeah, um, they, the head right. of Toyota research spoke at CES and a couple other places, and he talks about a couple things. One is this lulling. You know, you get this sense of false confidence. But he also talked about how we have a much higher expectation of autonomous vehicles than we do for human driven vehicles. So we've, we have learned to tolerate um, thousands of deaths per year or maybe millions. I'm 40, not sure. 40,000 deaths in the U.S. yearly. In the U.S. alone. And in the U.S. US alone, globally. more than a yeah. million globally. Right. A million. And, so that's, and now that's unacceptable. I'm sorry, by any standards, that's unacceptable. But we have two or three horrible situations with Tesla and suddenly that becomes a major crisis. So I agree with with you, Seth, that, that at the end of the day, I think these cars are going to save a lot more lives, even though there's going to be some tragic situations. But I think they're going to be relatively few. Yeah. yeah I think I mean, the news – I think the, the interesting thing about this is how few deaths there have been to right. this point. And, the, and that all of a sudden when you start to have them, that is actually a surprise and is – becomes news. They've actually almost done too good a job. We sort of expected there to be problems, but there wasn't in the early days. There's always going to be nitwits who turn on the autopilot in their Tesla and then get in the passenger seat or take a <laughs> well, nap. Actually, it won't allow that, will it? Will it allow that? Yeah. Doesn't it require you to no, touch the wheel every Seth, few seconds is, or something? You can, you can confirm yeah. this, but my experience has been it gives you a few minutes before it even notifies you that your hands aren't in the wheel. You have to actually move the wheel for it to know your hands are there. That was the nice yeah, thing. I, Think about the Cadillac had a had a capacitance system. It knew if your hands were there or not. You didn't have to jerk. Yeah, but you don't. That without the CT6, you don't actually have to have the uh, your hands, your hands don't on have the to wheel. Be on. Yeah, but your eyes have your to eyes. be. Yeah. And the, and the the other thing is like they have that green light across the top of the yeah. uh, steering wheel, which is like kind of keeps you, you know, focused on the. It goes the green task at hand. when you're in autopilot. It doesn't do lane changing like the Tesla does, which is probably a good thing. I always makes me really nervous. But it does mm -hmm. the lane keeping and it does the uh, adaptive cruise control. And I thought it did it quite well. And I like that yeah. green light because you know if it's engaged or not. It's very clear. Right. Um, but to go back to like the the bigger picture thing, like uh, all of these people who have done like incredibly stupid things, like. We, so, for instance, we got a, a, a tip from somebody who had fallen asleep, like out cold, and the Tesla drove through a uh, toll booth oh, uh, at highway speeds, and it clipped, uh, this is like a Model S, so a car, clipped one of the curbs in the, the, the toll booth. The guy flipped over like six times. He walked away, oh, from, which is like, you know, a good thing, I guess. Uh, but... You know, we never reported the story because we were like, you idiot. Why did you go to sleep on the freeway? You could have killed like 10 people. And, you know, clearly we weren't making friends with this possible story. Mm -hmm. But, you know, at the same time, it's just so frustrating because these people like Tesla's clearly saying, don't take your, you know, like pay attention. This right. is not you're not, you know, I actually I, I, I love the autopilot. I use it all the time and I wish I'd had it when I commuted. Because I was at, uh, at the end of the day when I was coming home, and I was always get sleepy, yeah. and I was always afraid that I would nod off. And while I wouldn't recommend doing it on purpose, at least I knew that if I briefly nodded off, the car wasn't going to veer off to the side; that it was going to keep the lane. Well, and the so thing, that I think I would have loved to have that. So I don't have autopilot, Absolutely. but I do have adaptive cruise control. And I just took a road trip from the Bay Area to Seattle. And it was a much more relaxing trip yes. because I didn't have to worry about starting and stopping. I yeah. got in traffic. I took my, you know. Oh, yeah, with traffic. Great. And I actually find that I that it actually helps me 
be less tired because I don't have to work as hard driving right. as I used to do. And I presume autopilot is even easier in terms of relaxing. Yeah. So Air, uh, yeah. Uber did not discontinue, but they've temporarily right. paused all autonomous. And they're, they're, they're doing it. They're going to do it in Pittsburgh. I believe they're going to restart it in Pittsburgh fairly soon. Well, what's interesting, California has just uh, uh, announced that it will allow autonomous cars to pick up passengers. So this is, you know, states, autonomous. states are, yeah, states are sort of competing for the right to host this kind of research, which I find interesting. Right, Cal because Arizona already has Waymo uh, right. doing autonomous driving, like on, on streets, public streets today. Right. And it will, they'll, they'll open up in, I think, Phoenix uh, later this year. So, you know, when people say like, eh, I don't know, this autonomous thing, it's going to be, you know, 10, 20 years from now, it's happening right now on public streets. And this year, Google will be doing it in a major city wow. or Waymo. Wow. Have they figured out the pricing model yet? What, what people are going to pay for those California rides? requires the rides to be free. At least that's because they're testing. No. Yeah. Okay. But at some point, I'm sure. I don't know. I mean, Uber, the entire Uber business model is based on the idea that they can get drivers out of the equation. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense at all. Right. Right. I mean, is Google just going to show you ads the whole time you're in the car? Like, <laughs> is that how the model is going to work? Hey, why not? You're not looking at the road. You can look at the ads. Right. <laughs> Uh, I love this headline. It's, it's, it's the ultimate link bait headline uh, in the, the next web. Self-driving cars will kill people, and we need to accept that. <laughs> uh, it is the number one most popular uh, article on uh, TNW right now, so there you go. Uh, it's, you, it's a good headline. It's, a, a it's pretty link well bait. It's headline. the ultimate link bait. It right? is a link bait. Yeah. Yeah. You got, that's right, you, though. It is. I mean, at the end right. of the day, some people will die from whatever. People will die from new medicines. Right. Uh, you know, m modern medicine kills people, but it kills people a lot from, less people than people they, if from, we didn't have it. Right? People die from wearing seatbelts. It's very rare, but there are there right. are rare cases but, where people die. But in, they're a good thing. Thing. Yeah, because yeah. most people are protected by them. But once in a while, something bad happens. If you want to use Facebook or Twitter in Uganda, you have to pay a nickel. It's you, quite a lot of money in Uganda. It quite is honestly. actually yeah. where the uh, per capita income is six hundred sixty-six dollars and ten cents. Um, but a tax. This is a oh. five cent tax, two hundred shillings levied on anyone who uses social networking or messaging apps like WhatsApp. Uh, it, it is they're calling it a social media tax, and the, they say the problem is <laughs> it promotes gossip. <laughs> the law, the law goes into effect yeah. as of July first. I think they're not wrong. Play, players going to gossip. I don't think it matters if you've got uh, you know WhatsApp or Facebook. Gossip happens. I'll I'll place a pretty substantial bet in here that this is absolutely a perfect way to graft some pretty good cash. <laughs> So on one hand, you get rid of people getting social media. You lose control of, you know, external forces influencing or the population. Charge a nickel. Charge a nickel, you put it into a fund, and, uh, you know, you, you loot that fund I, quite nicely, and then off you go. Five yeah. years. Is it in a nickel per session? Said, if I had a nickel for every idiot, that's going <laughs> you know, right. to be, be rich. That's a brilliant that's idea. Right. Let's pass a law. Uh, that, 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 to me, looks like straight-up corruption. <laughs> Uh, that's the uh, sort of tax is. that you can introduce. You yeah. can put it into a fund that you can do something with, end up buying a couple of chalets in France, a hotel in central London, and a couple of uh, flats in New York, and uh, and then retire. Mr. Greg Farrow, you're such a cynic, but that's uh, what makes you great. Packet Pushers <laughs> is uh, at packetpushers.net. Is that right? Yeah, that's exactly right. Okay, and Thank he's you. on the Twitter yeah. at Ethereal Mind. And uh, we love it whenever you can be on. I thank you for staying up late. What is it, two in the morning there? Uh, ten past one. Yes, but it's oh, certainly past the time nothing. because you know you don't you don't get to look this good by staying up to one o'clock every night. <laughs> thank you, Greg. Anything you want to plug before we uh, wrap this up? Uh, no, but if you are into enterprise IT, you probably love some of our podcasts Absolutely. and some of our enterprise IT coverage stuff. because we a uh, bunch of uh, blogs and we've also got a membership system we're about to launch soon. So stand by for that. Yes. Seth, it's been really great having you on. I hope you'll come back. Seth Weintraub is editor-in-chief okay. and founder and publisher of some of the best uh, online publications, including 9to5 Mac, 9to5 Google, Electric, and his newest, DroneDJ.com. Anything you want to plug, Seth? 
Uh, you you did my plugging for me. Leo. That's my Thank job. you very much. That's my job. I take it seriously. He's on the Twitter at LL Seth J. <laughs> uh, LL Cool J was taken, but LL Seth J is still, still available. Yes. I like it. <laughs> uh, we also thank you so much for being here, Mr. Larry Magid. He is LL Larry Magid J. No, no, he's not. He's at Larry Magid on the, on the Twitter. CBS News Radio, you hear him all the time. I hear you every day on KCBS, our local CBS station. Well, I'm glad somebody does. That's yep. good. Thank Connectsafely.org is the uh, website. Anything you'd like to plug? No, you know, just come by connectsafely.org and, uh, you know, learn a little bit about Internet safety and those kinds of things. And uh, that's it's, about it. It's and great listen, for kids. And listen, to, and listen to radio. Turn on that radio. Listen to radio. It's Classic. listening to you. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's the other stuff. No, that's not the radio. <laughs> radio. <laughs> it's not listening to you. That's right. That's, that's why you should listen to it. That's Ed. the new slogan. Listen to radio. <laughs> it's not listening to you. Exactly. <laughs> we do Twit every Sunday afternoon, 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern, 2200 UTC. Please stop by and watch us. Uh, we do it live. So you can uh, participate in the chat room live at irc.twit.tv. The live stream is on twit.tv slash live. We even uh, invite you to join us in the studio. If you're in the Northern California area, just email tickets at twit.tv. There's no charge. We'd like to make sure, uh, you know, we have a chair ready for you. And we had some great visitors, Cooper and Martin from Australia. We had uh, John from Toronto, Doug from Cascade, Iowa. He's here for WWDC. And Craig from... Say again? Michigan. Michigan. I didn't, it's not written on my card. Thank you guys for being here. We appreciate it. If you can't be here live, you can't watch live, you can always get on demand audio and video of everything we do at Twit, including this show at our website, twit.tv, or subscribe in your favorite podcast application. That way you'll get it automatically the minute it's available. As I said, audio and video, whether it's Apple Podcasts, Google Play Music, Stitcher, Slacker, Pocket Casts. We're everywhere. Thanks for being here. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. And we'll see you next time. Another twit this is in the can. Bye-bye. Doing the twit. Doing the twit. All right. Doing the twit, baby. Doing the twit. All right. Doing the twit. Oh, I forgot to mention uh, kind of a big breaking story. Shoot. Microsoft has apparently acquired GitHub. GitHub. Yeah. It's yeah. only a rumor, though. It's only a rumor. Yeah. It's not confirmed. Yeah, I would have liked to talk about it, but that is a huge story. Yeah, uh, that would have been a good segue from Bloomberg or from the Microsoft and Google battle because yeah. I think yeah. Google stopped building Google code because of GitHub. I didn't talk about the GitHub one because uh, it's only rumored. Yeah. There's no facts here. But and, it would have been uh, good to source. get your, uh, your all's analysis. Uh, why does Microsoft want a code? sharing uh site what what would be the they i think they use I mean, github I mean, now developers. i think they've settled all their stuff is is on github now is it not yeah i it's, think it's um, a relationship with indie developers yeah. important that's a big thing for microsoft these days actually on ram to azure yeah, yeah. so the idea would reporting it as if it's true be, yeah, i think uh, it's true it's if it's bloomberg i think it's true and they say they'll announce monday and you know i think that's true because there's not going to be any news on Monday with the WWDC. Yeah, actually, right. you know, there's not going to be any news, actually. It's going to be such a boring dub dub. I'm, I know. I'm really I'm disappointed. Actually, with this backache, I'm actually debating whether I'm going yeah. to go. It's going to be dull. I don't know if I want to sit in a chair for two hours listening to Tim Cook and friends. Yeah. It's like what Microsoft bought LinkedIn so that they could get the um, office, uh, the corporate value of the network that's inside of LinkedIn and Absolutely. then bind it into Microsoft Office. So Absolutely. you're seeing things like their um, dynamics and their uh, SharePoint. Uh, salespeople can go out there and automatically click a button. And if you know who your customer is, the name of the person, then they can actually build a profile of that person. And the salesperson then knows a hell of a lot more about the, the victim. Uh, sorry, customer, potential victim, customer, victim. prospect, <laughs> victim. Yeah. And they like, they does, know. Uh, and, does, um, Google still do what do they use for their code uh, repository? They used to have Google Code, but they closed that because all their they folks were using GitHub. GitHub. Yeah, everybody loves GitHub. I'm not right. sure I love the where... company. There's been some less than savory stuff at the company, but yeah. uh, I love Maybe GitHub. I do love Google GitHub. Fire Google Code Backup yeah. if that happens. 
and maybe Google Reader. Well, there's other Git, right? you know, there's GitLab, there's other uh, uh, Git, Git hosting, and of course you could run your own Git hosting. There's no reason why you wouldn't want to. I think the future here is serverless. This idea that you don't actually want to run a container or a virtual yeah. machine or you don't want to have to worry about any of that. So if you have GitHub, you could have this thing where it's like a click to deploy. Right. It automatically takes it out of GitHub and straight into Azure serverless and... It'll take a couple of years for that to work that out. But that sounds seems to, sweet. That hey, guys, I'm going to say goodbye. Good. i got to go. All right, Larry. Go. I, yeah, I yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's gone on way too long. Go watch Dig the down. Warriors game. Talk all you want. All right. Carry on. <laughs> See ya. Yep. So that would be my punt is they'd look for a tie-up yeah. where you check your code into GitHub and then you have your CICD, you have your Jenkins pipeline and all that sort of stuff. And then it comes straight out of the That's actually the brilliant. Continuous, yeah. And then goes straight into production That's on brilliant. Razor. I like mm. that. Yeah. And um, that would be because that, huge. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of synergies yeah. that you could probably do. I'm yeah. thinking about what uh, if you talk to people at uh, various of the big silicon companies, they have a whole entire teams of people just building that sort of pipeline. Uh, it goes from developer to testing to commissioning to straight into production over and over and over. And this would be a way of, and as uh, Seth said, it would also be bringing the developers closer to Microsoft and pulling them away from AWS. They love that. That's why they do uh, LSW and all that stuff. Yeah. All right, guys. Thanks, Leo. See you later. Have a great See night. You again sometime. Cheers. Yeah, take care.